when uh, we will uh, call for the introductory recording, please. Before we begin the Before agenda, we begin the, agenda the, Wichita the Wichita Sedgwick County, County Metropolitan Area Planning, Area Planning Commission and the Wichita, and the Wichita Sedgwick, County Sedgwick, Sedgwick County Board of Zoning, of Zoning Appeals would like to take this, opportunity, like to take this opportunity to welcome everyone to this public, to this public hearing. For those in attendance, for those in attendance copies, of copies of the agenda for today's meeting, the public hearing procedure, public hearing procedure and, planning and planning department staff reports, staff reports on all agenda items are available, in the, are available in the lobby. The Planning Commission and the BZA's bylaws limit the applicant on a zoning subdivision, subdivision or, variance or variance application and his or her, and his or her representatives to a total of, to a total 10, minutes of 10 minutes of speaking time at the start of the hearing, the on, that of the hearing on that plus item up to plus two up to two minutes at the conclusion of that, of that hearing. All other persons, All wishing, other persons to wishing to speak on agenda items are limited to three, three minutes per person. person. However, however, if they feel, if they feel that it is needed and justified, the chairman may extend these times by up to two minutes. All speakers all speakers are requested to state his or her, his name, or her and name and address for the record. Beginning to when beginning to speak, when you are finished, speaking, you are finished please speaking, share your name, please share your name, address, address and, the case number, and the case on the number sheet provided on the, in the sheet room. provided in the room. This will enable staff, this will to, enable notify staff to notify you if there are any if there additional are proceedings, proceedings concerning, that concerning that item. All speakers at the all podium, speakers at the podium, please remove your please face remove your face mask before speaking, before into, speaking the into the microphone. Please note that please all note that all written and visual materials materials you present to the commission to the and commission the board and the will board be retained will be retained by the secretary as part of the official part record. of the official record if you are not speaking, if you are not speaking but you wish to be notified, you wish to be about, notified about future on proceedings a on case, a particular case please provide your please contact provide your information, contact to, information the to the planning department the planning commission the planning and the board, board, and the board are, are interested in hearing the views of all persons who wish to express themselves on all the agenda items however we ask that all speakers be as Please be as courteous and, and concise as possible, and avoid long repetitions, avoid long repetitions of facts or opinions which have already been which have already been stated. For your information, for your information, the Wichita City, the Wichita City, Council, has City Council has adopted a policy for all city zoning, all city zoning progress. A copy of this policy, of this is, policy available is available from the planning from staff. The, planning staff. The, city the City Council relies on a written record of the Planning, of the planning hearing Commission hearings and does not and does not conduct its own, its own additional public hearings on these items. The decision of the decision. Of the, of the BZA is final. Any appeal of any appeal of a decision of the BZA is to the district, to the district court. Thank you. Thank you. Um, today, um, today I'm going to commissioners, commissioners shake, things shake things up just, just a little, little bit, bit, and we're going to start, start by calling the Board of Zoning, zoning appeals, appeals to order. order. So, so I'm, I'm opening, opening the Board of Zoning, zoning Appeals. Uh, business and would ask for a roll call of commissioners in attendance, please. Certainly. Fox. Present. Present. Dual. Dual. Here. Here. McKay. McKay. Here. Here. Green. Green. Here. Here. Bill Johnson. Bill Johnson, Bill Johnson is, is absent. absent. Blick. Blick. Here. Here. Nix. Nix. Here. Here. Foster. Foster. Here. Here. Warren. Warren. Here. Here. Joe Johnson. Joe Johnson. Joe Johnson. Joe Johnson. Mr. Mr. Johnson, Johnson is showing, is showing up, up as being, being online, online participating, participating virtually. virtually. Okay. Okay. Well, well, we see, we see that he's there. there. We'll, we'll see, see if he speaks, speaks up. up. Miles. Present. Present. Hart Hartman. Here. Here. Aldridge. Aldridge. Here. Here. Williams, Williams Bay. Bay. Here. Here. Show 13, 13 members, members present, present if, if we, we count, count Mr. Joe Johnson. Johnson. Okay, th thank, thank you. you. Um, um, commissioners, commissioners, I bring, I bring your, attention your attention to the agenda. agenda. It, it includes, includes the meeting minutes, minutes approval, approval, but we did, we did not, not receive, receive those minutes, minutes in our packet. In our packet. And, and the BZA case, case 2023-18 was withdrawn by, by the applicant. applicant. So, so I, would I would accept a motion to defer the meeting minutes to our next scheduled meeting. Motion, motion from, from Commissioner, Commissioner McKay, second, second from, from Commissioner, Commissioner Green. Green. All in All favor, favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 And uh, opposed, opposed, same, same sign. sign. Motion, motion passes 13-0. We'll, we'll defer minutes, minutes to the next, to the next scheduled BCA meeting. meeting. 
and, and I, I now, now adjourn this BZA, BZA meeting. meeting. Thank, Thank you. you. Now, now welcome, welcome to the May 11th, 11th meeting, meeting of the, the Metropolitan Area Planning, Planning Commission. Commission. Uh, uh, we've, we've already, already called, called our roll. roll. We have, we have received, received minutes, minutes of two, two previous, previous meetings. meetings. I'll, start I'll start with minutes, minutes for, for the April 13th, 2023 meeting. meeting. Move for uh, approval. Have a, have a motion, approval motion for approval from, from, from and a and second. A second. Any, Any discussion? discussion? All, All in, favor in favor indicate by, by saying, saying aye. 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 And that was, and that was Hartman, Hartman and Blick, Blick by, by the way. way. Uh, uh, any, any opposed? opposed? Nay. Nay. Minutes, minutes of the April 13th meeting are approved as submitted. Minutes, minutes of, of the April 27th, 27th meeting, meeting were also, also in your packet. packet. Any, Any discussion? discussion? Move for approval. Motion, 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 motion from, from Commissioner, Commissioner Hartman, Hartman, second, second from Commissioner Green. Green. All, in All in favor, favor indicate, indicate by, by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Nay. Nay. Motion, motion passes. Pass it. Oh, oh, and, and uh, we, we have, have one abstention. abstention Unix, Unix, so, so motion, motion passes 12, 12 0, zero one. one. 1201 excuse me 1201 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, um, this, um, this doesn't, doesn't mean, mean that we're not paying attention, attention to them. It means that we've discussed, discussed them at subdivision or uh, advanced, advanced plans, plans meeting, meeting and, and will not, will not further, further hear them here. Them here. Um, so, so, item, item subdivision 2023-00012. This, this case, case has, has been uh, requested, requested by, by the applicant to defer to, to the next, next meeting, meeting, which I believe is June 8th. So we so will we not, not uh, address, address that item today. Public, Public hearing, hearing items, items. There, there are two, two vacation, vacation items. items. Vacation, vacation item 2023, quadruple 09, 09, located near Web Road, Road and 37th North. Does North. Is, is anyone, anyone on the commission want to hear this case? case? Anyone in chambers want to hear this case? And does anyone, and seeing none, does anyone participating virtually want to hear this case? Vacation 2023, quadruple 09. We'll take that item on consent. Item 3.2, vacation item 2023-00010, located between 263rd Street West and 231st Street West, um, just south of US 254, or US 54. Does anyone on the commission want to hear this case? Seeing none, anyone in chambers want to hear this case? Seeing none, anyone participating virtually want to hear this case? We'll take 3.2 on consent. Uh, that ends the vacation items. Motion to approve uh, 3.1 and 3.2. Motion from Commissioner Blick. Second. Second from Commissioner Williams Bay. Any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, nay. Motion passes 13-0. Moving on to the public hearing items. The first item, 4.1, conditional use 2023-00010. We are recommending denial, so we will hear case 4 .1, or item 4.1. Item 4.2, conditional use 2023-00011, located near Woodlawn and 17th Street North. Is there anyone on the commission who would like to hear this case? Yes. Okay, we will hear 4.2. <laughs> Item 4.3, conditional use 2023-00012, located at 2431 East Mount Vernon Road. Does anyone on the commission want to hear this case? Is there anyone in chambers who would like to hear this case? Seeing none, anyone participating virtually who would like to hear this case? 2431 East Mount Vernon Road. We'll take item 4.3 on consent. Item 4.4, .4, um, community unit plan 2023-00013 and zoning case 2023-00019. Um, the staff is recommending something different than the uh, applicant is open to, so I would recommend we hear this case. Is the applicant or agent present? 
Okay. And We're, was the agent for 4.1 and 4.2 present? Okay. Very good. Uh, yes? We're getting an indication from the agent for the CUP case that they may be in agreement. So Okay, so we should go through, through the case. Okay. Just to avoid having to hear it if All they right. are in agreement. Very good. So I will go back to item 4.4. Does anyone on the commission want to hear this case? 53rd Street North and North Meridian Avenue. CUP and zoning. Does anyone in chambers want to hear this case? And does anyone participating virtually want to hear this case? I'm withdrawing my statement that there was disagreement. Okay. No one virtually, so we could take 4.4 on consent. Item 4.5, zoning case 2023 0016, located at Mount Vernon Road and west of South Washington Avenue. Does anyone want to, on the commission want to hear this case? This is item 4.5. Anyone in chambers want to hear this case? Seeing none, anyone participating virtually want to hear this case? 726 East Mount Burton. Hearing none, we can take 4.5 on consent. Item 4.6, zoning case 2023 0017, located at 45th Street North and North Webb Road. Does anyone on the commission want to hear this case? Anyone in chambers want to hear this case? Seeing none, anyone participating virtually want to hear this case? Hearing none, 4.6 will be taken on consent. Item 4.7, zoning case 2023 0018 located at Hydraulic and 55th Street South, 1306 East, 55th Street South. Anyone on the commission want to hear this case? Yes. Okay, we will hear 4.7. And item 4.8, uh, regarding the short-term rental, we will hear that case. Madam Chair, I move that we approve items 4.3, 4.4, 4.5, and 4.6. I have a motion from Commissioner Green. Second. Second from Commissioner Blick. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all in favor indicate by an aye. 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 Any opposed, nay. Motion passes 13 0. That brings us back to the top of the agenda. Um, Conditional use 2023 0010, and we'll ask Christina please to come forward for the staff uh, report. Good afternoon, everyone. Christina Reith, Associate Planner with the Metropolitan Area Planning Department. This is case number CON 2023 0010. The applicant is requesting a conditional use for group residence limited on a property zoned SF5 single family residential located at 7000 East Stonegate Lane. According to the applicant's website, the Ivy Foundation operates sober home living facilities. And these are similar to a group home, which in this case can accommodate up to eight persons who are not related by blood or marriage and can occupy a residence. The request for a conditional use in this case is for group residence limited which would allow the facility to house up to 15 persons, including staff. Um, the site plan submitted by the applicant shows a three-car garage and a driveway with three parking spaces. Uh, since the staff report was written, they have submitted an administrative adjustment to allow parking within the set front setback as long as it's within eight feet of the property line. The subject site is located on the interior portion of the neighborhood. It's um, far from the um, arterial streets. And so it is planning staff's opinion that the requested conditional use for this particular location may have detrimental impacts on the surrounding properties due to an increase in traffic and increase in parking requirements, which are out of character with the neighborhood. The conditional use request is in partial conformance with the com community investments plan. The 2035 Wichita Future Growth Concept Map identifies the site as residential, which reflects the full diversity of residential development densities and types typically found in an urban municipality. 
The requested conditional use is not in conformance with the land use compatibility locational guidelines. The general guidelines state, higher intensity development should be discouraged from locating areas in two areas of existing lower intensity development, particularly established low density residential areas. Group residence limited is allowing up to 15 persons, including two staff members, in the interior of a single family residential neighborhood. The scale of this type is out of, uh, of residential use is out of character with the existing surrounding uses. The number of residents who could drive versus the number of on-site parking requirements may be detrimental to the character of the neighborhood. The other thing we looked at was public services, particularly public transportation. Wichita Transit provides regular bus service within one quarter mile southeast of the subject site at the northeast corner of East 13th Street North and North Governor Road. So it's a little bit over half a mile from the subject site. So if even if the uh, occupants didn't have cars, public transportation is a little bit less accessible here. The requested conditional use is in conformance with the goals of the Wichita Places for People plan. Uh, the requested group residence partially aligns with one of the strategies called Strategy 5. Provide a diversity of housing options to attract new residents and allow existing residents to remain in the established central area. However, the scale of the development is out of character with the neighborhood. Based on the information available prior to the public hearing, MAPD staff recommends that the application be denied. Uh, when you look at the golden rules, uh, the first one talks about the zoning uses and character of the neighborhood. It is planning staff's opinion that the requested conditional use for this particular location may have detrimental impacts on the surrounding properties due to an increase in traffic and increase in parking requirements. Uh, if we skip down to number three, the extent to which removal of the restrictions will detrimentally affect nearby property. It is staff's opinion that it could have detrimental impacts on the character of the neighborhood, such as aforementioned increased traffic and an impact on the aesthetics of the neighborhood due to the increased parking requirements. We skip down to number six, relative gain to the public, health, safety, and welfare compared to the loss in value or hardship imposed upon the applicant. Approval of the request could have detrimental impacts on the surrounding residents, such as increased traffic. Denial could be regarded as a loss of opportunity, economic opportunity and enjoyment for the applicant. Lastly, opposition or support from the neighborhood residents. At the time the staff report was prepared, staff received several comments in, in opposition to the proposed conditional use via telephone and email. These comments are submitted. Um, I submitted some to you guys via email. Some are attached to the end of this report, and some which came in after Monday are, on the, pa are, are the packets on your table. Should the MAPC find that the conditional use be approved, it is recommended that the MAPC adopt alternative findings supporting the recommendation. Staff recommends the following conditions. One, the conditional use approval is limited to a maximum of 15 persons, including staff members. Two, they must submit a revised site plan illustrating that they satisfy the parking requirements. Three, that no signs shall be allowed except those under the city sign code, or it's, yeah. Four, the site shall be developed and operated in compliance with all federal, state, and local rules and regulations. And lastly, if the zoning administrator finds that there are any violation of these conditions, the zoning administrator in conjunction with the planning director may declare the conditional use is null and void. This went to the district advisory board, district two on Monday, and it was approved by the DAB. Um, with the condition that it would allow a maximum of 12 persons, including staff. And let's go to the site photos here. So this is looking north towards the site. Next slide. Oh, this is looking east away from the site. You can see where the road starts to bend around and it's on the interior of the neighborhood. Next slide, please. This is looking directly south away from the site. Next slide, please. And uh, this is looking west towards um, uh, away from the site. Next slide, please. And those are all my site photos. And with that, I will stand for questions. We have questions for staff at this point. Just, just a quick one. Commissioner Green. The, the DAB approved it. Was Did you say 12? With a maximum of 12, including, including staff including members. Including staff, not yes. plus staff. Including staff. Okay, thank you. Any other questions for staff? 
If not, we would call the applicant or agent to come forward, please. Um, you have 10 minutes, and please start with your name and address from the podium, please. Hello, my name is Ivory Kaufman. My address is 488 North Wyndham Road, Wichita, Kansas, 67219. Um, Ivy Home Foundation. I am the owner and operator. Um, I began Ivy Home Foundation because I saw a need in Wichita for more sober housing and of a different sort. Um, I traveled to multiple different cities, Dallas, Richmond, Seattle, um, to see what kind of housing they were offering for the sober community. Um, I attended a NAR conference, and that is the standard that I use and follow um, for my sober houses. Uh, that's the National Association of Recovery Residences. Kansas is not an affiliate of NAR, um, but I choose to follow that standard. Um, so that's just part of who I am as a business person, and it's also why I'm applying for the permit. Um, with that said, um, I am completely separate from Oxford or Hemingway or um, what are the, some of the other ones we have in Wichita? Those are the ones that are most commonly known. Um, my men's house is full um, and my women's house is close. Um, if you are keeping tabs on what is happening across the nation, but also in Wichita, um, it's extremely, it's, sorry, it's heartbreaking. Um, the death in fentanyls, it's, it's rising and it's, it's going to keep going up. Um, but with that, we're also seeing an increase in the number of people who are moving to sobriety and Oxford houses, Hemingway, um, as well as Big Fish Bail Bonds has some houses. Um, and um, Wichita Bail Bonds has some houses. They're all full. So that is why I put forward and request an increase in my ability to house more people. Um, this house specifically, it's 3,000 square feet, five bedroom, three bathrooms. It is not my intention to crowd people. Um, it's why the homes I purchase are 3,000 square feet and above. Um, but, and this is a little bit American, we like the idea of people, every child in the family having their own bedroom <laughs> and every person in the house having room to spread out. But if you go back um, to the research that's been done by Oxford and sober homes run well with an average of 12 people. The best sober homes have 12 people. And that took a long time to sink in for me because at first my mindset was I will never do more than eight. You'll never see me put more than that number in a house. Um, and it was just the more things that I read that that is a, a number for community, for people to sharing resources, sharing cars, because typically when a person comes into sobriety, they don't have a car. Um, resources regarding, I know this place, this job, this. They share a lot of things. I have no idea. OK, good, a timer running. Thank you. <laughs> um, so I model my housing. I'm a housing provider only. I am not a program. I model it off of um, a group in Seattle. Um, there have been a lot of questions asked by the neighborhood about my ability to operate a house. I think some of that honestly has to do with being female and having a young face. Um, I can provide my resume if you would like. Um, and there have been uh, a neighbor went and looked up my home loans down at the Hall of Records, which is completely their right. Just so you know, my lending is secure. My home loan is not being called. And this use, this conditional use for my property in no way changes the terms of my lending. Um, there have been questions about the number of police, uh, the number of times police have been called to my homes. 
I opened in January, and the police have never been called to my men's house. Um, they were called to the women's house twice, and both of those were for a mental health visit. Um, a female, um, how would you say it? A female um, felt like she was, said she um, was going to commit suicide. She felt like she was in danger of taking her life. I could have handled it on my own, honestly, and I was handling it, but I don't know how many of you have had the chance to experience our Wichita police now. They are incredible. It is not the same policing of 20 years ago. They were so calm and quiet, and they were in and out within five minutes. It was, it was gorgeous. I, and most of my women have experienced other um, women in sobriety have experienced a completely different kind of policing before they became sober. And so it was a great opportunity to get to see police in a completely different side. It was, it was fantastic. So that's what the two calls were. Um, let's see. Um, yeah, and then, it, I, do you have any questions for me? What if do you want to know? If we begin the questioning, then you vacate your last three and a half minutes of presenting. Oh. So, well, I, you, I can keep going. To... I can tell you guys all about what I'm doing. Okay. <laughs> or do we, if you're open to. I have more I can share. Um, so as an operator, I follow precise protocol in what I do. Um, and a lot of that comes from the NAR standards that I follow. Um, and uh, let's see, yeah. Um, the neighbors are very frustrated with what they see as a lack of communication from me. Um, I spoke with landlords and leadership in Hemingway and Oxford and this group out of Seattle, and all of them told me across the board, do not tell the neighbors anything when you open. Just open and put people in. I, and I chose not to because I am not Hemingway or Oxford or, yeah, they said you have a right to open. Simply open it, get whatever licensing your state requires, and move people in. And it's not who I am, so I didn't. Um, I gave neighbors my cell phone number, my email address. I answered text messages, phone calls, and every question I answered led to more questions. And I discovered everything that was being gathered was then used to um, file a citation, what, what is it called, against me in um, commercial zoning. A commercial zoning violation was filed two different times that I provided information. Um, I was never, mm, I was cleared both times of the violations. Um, and the kinds of questions that I was asked were things like, um, what are your house rules? What are the consequences for breaking a rule? Um, what is your eviction process? What violations would cause an eviction? How will you ensure the safety of the neighborhood? Will you do a background every, check on every resident, and then probably the one that was the most galling was we need to be provided with those background checks. And that was by three different people. We need to be provided with the background checks for every resident. Um, that's all. Okay. Thank you for your testimony. I'll open it for questions from the commission at this oh, point. Okay. So stay at the podium, Commissioner Green. Yeah, thank you for your uh, your presentation. Uh, I do appreciate what you do. There is obviously a need in our community for this, and it is unfortunately increasing. the The concern, though, that I have is the number of residents that, that you have in a what I see what you have said is a, a five bedroom house. Mm -hmm. um, does that in, that would be overnight stays, or is that oh just, yes, yeah, living that, there, uh, yes. So so. The, you've got your, your request is 15 with including two staff and that's why I qualify I wanted to find out what the DAB said 
So when I applied, the um, what I saw written was 15, was that a conditional use permit was for 15 people. I was like, OK, I guess that's what I'm applying for. My desire is I would, personally, I would never put more than 12. I need a little bit of room to be able to say, I have eight, and I know these two people are going to be moving out in the next month. I'm interviewing two more people who want to move in. So I want to move these two people in while these two people are moving out. So I have 10 in the house right now. Does that make sense? Yeah, I get that. So the, the staff, are, are they awake all night or would they be also staying overnight, sleeping in, in the house? So this is not that kind of staffed residence. This is a, um, a group residence limited. So I have um, staff that are also have their own jobs. So it's not, it's not staffed the same as you think of a Starkey house, where the staff is there 24-7 um, watching residents. It's, it's staffed where this is the person in charge and watching over, but not, it, it, it's a different kind of staffing, which actually, um, Christina would be very good at answering. So it's a different you, level of staffing requirement. Can you tell us when a staff member is physically present in the home? Because this kind of goes to parking requirements too. So what hours is there a staff member at the home? I'd say about 20 hours a day, and I'm there the other two to four. So there's always someone there. Yeah, there's always okay. someone and, at the house. And they're alert and awake, not sleeping also in the room, in the building. Correct. I mean, there's times at night, though, when staff would be asleep, and that's OK. These are all adults. I, what, They're what not I, people that need constant supervision. I, I guess what I'm getting at is five bedrooms for a maximum would be 15. You're saying maybe 13 or 14. 12. 12 is the maximum, including staff. Oh, OK, because that's what the DAB uh, approved. I believe the DAB was intending to approve 10 with two staff. That was their intention. Things were pretty heated and complicated at the end there when they were voting. I believe their intention was to pass a maximum of 12 people, including staff. I guess what I'm trying to get at is how many people are in each room and how many people in each room would be sleeping overnight. And Because you know, it just seems like it would be crowded to have that many, that many people in a five bedroom house, whether it's 10 or 12 or up to 15. So there's three living rooms and a kitchen and a dining room and it's two people to a bedroom. Um, and typically people work every kind of shift. I mean, there's three different shifts in the day. And so it's pretty rare that all 12 people are home at the same time, except for the house meeting, which is mandatory for everybody. Um, does that answer your question? Yeah, it does. And and then I guess to uh, go further on what Ann had to say, um, how do you propose to address the parking concerns? So there are three slots in the inside the garage, which we have not been using um, because we haven't needed to. Uh, we've been we've had things in there that have been stored as people have been sorting through things. So beginning to use those parking stalls in the garage, and then three stalls outside of that. Um, but it's one of the things of this, I guess you would say, this demographic that not as many have cars. There being one resident gets picked up for work. Um, the bus station being, the bus stop being half a mile away, that's actually considered quite close for Wichita. Um, and so they walk to take the bus. Um, or to the grocery store, um, and then they do a lot of ride sharing together. So I cannot, I cannot guarantee this, obviously, but especially for the men's house, 
for about 12 people, you could expect about six cars. Um, you said 10, 10 cars? Six. Six cars, okay. Mm -hmm. And then plus the staff cars coming to and from? Is I'm the only staff. Okay. I thought you said there was another staff person that so, took part of the time. Yes, but they're one part of the time. 12. Okay, they're one of the clients, actually. Yes, the okay. staff are residents. Okay, gotcha. Um, Commissioner Aldrich, you have a question? Yeah, I'm getting a little confused on exactly how many, the separation between staff and, and the actual residents. So what you're saying, there's going to be 10 uh, residents and then two staff, uh, or are you looking at 12 residents, two of those would be considered staff? And, you know, uh, exactly how many staff personnel are going to be there 24 hours a day? If you have two staff people, they work in 12 hour shifts, or you're just utilizing part of the residents uh, and designating. A couple of mess staff. There. Each house has a house leader who is given, who takes on a leadership role, and then I have a second in the house as well. Okay, so you basically you're not going to have anybody that is qualified or trained to be part of your. You're just calling it staff. They they are leader. qualified. And how are they and trained? How are they trained? What kind of training do you have? And I use a program out of NAR, um, and we have an online. There's so many things that you can get online now. Um, training in trauma informed care certifications, but yeah, and I don't know how much you know about how. Oxford, Hemingway, how they operate, but it's you vote in the next president and that's the staff. Uh, just out of curiosity, what is the age range between your residents, uh, like your youngest and your oldest? I accept anyone who is an adult above the age of 18 and above. My age range right now is 24 to 64. Commissioner okay. Nix, you had a question? Yeah, earlier on in your presentation, you used the word interviewing. I'm just curious, I mean, this would speak to how safe the environment is, I suppose. So you interview people, uh, some make the cut, some, some don't, I suppose. Right? Can you expand on that a little bit? Yeah, so a large pro part of the interview process, it's less about what someone says and um, more about their, uh, my house leaders could speak on this more than I could, um, and, and more about their ability be, to be forthcoming. Um, do they seem open to, um, are, are they able to talk about their past? Um, and at what point in the recovery process are they? Um, their body language says quite a bit. Um, and we look into their background and do a background check. Um, but probably the thing that matters the most is that I am extremely uh, quick to evict someone who can't follow the rules. Commissioner. Herman, go ahead. Is this house we're talking about, is this for the men or the women? This is the women's house. Okay. It's and on a average, how many, how many cars are parked there at the house? Four. I'm curious about the garage. I know a lot of people living in 3,000 square feet that can only get one car in the garage. And you mentioned that you have been using the garage for storage. Uh, many times in a group home, the garages are also remodeled for living additional living space. And you mentioned three living room areas. Mm -hmm. So is 
is the garage free and open for three parked vehicles? Yeah, it is. It's And it would remain that way under yeah. your It's use really of this been home. a matter of I can be a little bit of a collector when somebody offers me free stuff. <laughs> it's like, oh, free dressers. We just have to move them into the rooms. Okay, so three could be used. And mm -hmm. if we went to the slide, when the setback is variance, administrative setback for the parking in the driveway, does that actually allow a car then to cross the sidewalk that no. goes through that area? No. Okay. I just wanted to make sure of that. Yeah. Any other questions from the commissioners at this time? Okay. Thank you. Stay tight. The next portion will be public comments. So we will invite anyone present who would like to speak on this item to come forward. Uh, we'd, you can sit down. Okay. But you want to listen carefully because you'll have an opportunity to come back and respond to the concerns that are expressed at the end of all the public comments. Okay? So... Uh, I assume there are persons present who would like to speak on this item. Please make your way to the podium. Be be begin by giving your name and address, please. Uh, that allows us to make sure you receive information about this case as it progresses. And you have three minutes to make your presentation. So thank you, sir. Your name? Hi, my name is Robert Garland. I live at 6916 East Stonegate Street, just to the west of this home. Okay, thank you. The public utilities in this neighborhood cannot sustain the current residents. Adding more residents would be detrimental to the city. I thank the commissioners for their concerns about what the home is operating as, but that is not your mandate. Your mandate is to be stewards of the land. Since moving to my home, I have seen multiple failures and problems of the city's infrastructure. During the year of 2022, Stonegate has seen water delivery infrastructure failure leading to property damage, water waste, and financial burden to the residents. 6913 East Stonegate experienced flooding in the yard and the street, sustained, sustained distribution, disruption to their lawn and landscaping from the repair by the city, requiring extra time and effort to maintain their property. Also in 2022, a gas delivery service failure was experienced. Residents to 6916 and 6917 had property disrupted due to the gas line leaking. The delivery line to 6916 was replaced. Possibly others were replaced. I have not spoken to those residents. The lawn and landscaping was needed to be repaired, not only by the gas line company, but as well as the residents themselves. The driveway, uh, there was also a service outage due to this. We could not use the gas uh, running to our homes. The driveway in front of 6917 was disturbed and needed to be repaired. The street in front of 6916, 6913, 6917, and 7000 were disrupted due to the processes needed to ventilate the excess gas that was leaked into the underground. We had to accommodate these repairs for a sustained period of time and could not utilize certain areas of the street for parking and experienced noise pollution, disrupting residents' sleep. If this happens again, the potential increase of cars and traffic could affect the repairs and the quality of life. The streets in front of 7,000 have experienced failures. Since 2018, when I moved in, I have called and had the pothole filled three times due to existing traffic patterns. If the number of cars and traffic increase, that would be detrimental to the infrastructure of the street. Not only is the uh, street in front of Lawrence Lane, a arterial street feeding this neighborhood, as well as the section in front of Coleman Middle School on 13th Street, already being slated for repairs due to the number of traffic. The sewer system can also not uh, sustain increased residents. There is a medical services facility on this uh, line servicing the area. I personally worked for the sewer system of Wichita for two years. I experienced sewer backups as well as need for uh, maintaining the sewer line. The 50-year-old system has a potential to fail due to the ingress of roots and excess usage by residents. Pat uh, particularly since this is a female house, the residents have the potential to flush feminine hygiene your, products. Your three-minute time okay. is up. I think we can all imagine the rest of that sentence. And... Um, uh, so if you could 
Do you have any thought that you were unable to express? Or are there any questions of the commissioners? Yes. Uh, Commissioner Foster? These utility failures that the neighborhood has experienced, are they, can you tell me, do you know whether the failures were of the dis, dis city distribution lines out in the street or were they on the individual service lines to individual properties? The gas line as well as the water line were the city responsibility, where, or the city or the utility responsibility where they failed, not the residents. They were out the street. Yes, they were. Thank you. Any other questions, Commissioner Williams Bay? Where is your home in, in relationship to the? And the other addresses you were giving, are they on the same block facing the same street? This is 7,000, this is 6916, this is 6913, and this is 6917. Okay, thank you for pointing that out. Any other questions for the speaker? Okay, thank you for your testimony. May I ask one question that I was not allowed to before by the uh, staffing? 15, 20 seconds. Okay. Was the historical data of the existing infrastructure problems ex uh, experienced, was that explored or was it taken into consideration when the DAB or you guys okay. are uh, and evaluating it? Yeah, those questions will be answered on the rebuttal. Okay, thank you. Next speaker, please. I will remind you of the instructions given at the beginning of the meeting, recognizing there are a number of people who want to speak. We've heard about infrastructure issues. That was a very thorough review of that. So each successive speaker, we ask not to repeat things we've already heard about unless you have a significantly different piece of information to offer. Okay? And your name and address, please. Thanks for coming. Hi, my name is Jeffrey Poe. I live at 6913 East Stonegate. I would like to talk on the public safety aspect. I do have a background in public safety. I've worked 10 years with uh, the city's public safety department. Uh, what I'd like to talk about is the risk and concern of the amount of vehicles and driving age individuals that will be at the house if it is granted the, the permission. Uh, right now, it, I guess it is assumed that four people are there but we can't assume that during the whole life of this property, having that many people that are of driving age are not going to be driving cars. We, we can do all the assuming we want, but the fact is if there's 12 people that can drive, there could be 12 vehicles at the house. Uh, I've made calls on multiple people that have been struck by vehicles in ob obscured areas where the driver couldn't see somebody, and I wouldn't wish that upon any person being the driver, the individual struck, or the family of that individual. I, I don't want myself, the residents, or any of the neighbors in my block to be part of that. I, I think from a public safety standpoint, the possibility of having 12 extra vehicles when six can comfortably fit within the driveway and garage is detrimental to not only the neighborhood, but the people therein and the people that walk around. And I'm open to any questions. Any questions for the speaker? Did you have a couple slides on feet per bedroom? Did I see? I, okay. I did not. All right. Thank you for your testimony. Any questions, commissioners? Okay. Next speaker, please. So I'm Monica Poe. I live at 6913 East Stonegate as well. Um, the slides that were up there I did uh, present to the DAB in regards to just the amount of space within the house and the bedrooms, and I believe that was kind of already discussed within the uh, commission, so I won't bring that up. But I do want to say um, we understand the group home is here, and it's lawfully allowed to be here in the neighborhood. We just think the addition is what is violating the golden rules of zoning changes. So any more than what is allowed by right is what the change to the zoning and uses of characteristics of the land. And we strongly recommend that you take the staff's recommended denial of the, uh, of the permit. So if the MAPC truly believes it is not in violation, please just take the time to consider that this has only been here since February 25th. That is the first day that residents moved in. 
And so it's been two months and two weeks, and we've seen two police cars calls already. Well, I think it's great we're utilizing city resources. I also know the strain that can put on them. And I just want to make sure that everything is taken care of before we put additional strain, as in more additional residents. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions for the speaker? Thank you. Next speaker, please. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Jen Chi Chen. I have lived in uh, 7005 Stonegate for 32 years. I'm not going to repeat what uh, my neighbors uh, have already mentioned, but I uh, uh, was kind of surprised at a DEP meeting that one of the members supporting the application mentioned to all of us that our concern for property value is just our imagination. I'm an economics professor at Wichita State, so I did some research. I would like to share with you two articles. Um, one is, uh, one was published in the Journal of Sustainable Real Estate, using a large sample from uh, Central Virginia uh, to do the analysis. And uh, three professors, they found out that embedding this type of house into the residential area is going to cause on average a drop of 8%, 8% of property value and uh, of course tax value as well. And in some cases, it's 14%. Then I continue on with another research published by a very famous, prestigious National Bureau of Economic Research, MBER. That's the most pre uh, prestigious research organization. Also, three professors found out, using Seattle as an example, and discovered that this type of house is going to decrease the property value of the surrounding home by an average of 3.4% to 4.6%. Um, adding this to those issues that my neighbors have already mentioned, this profit-making company has created a lot of negative external effect to the neighbors. If you have any question. Any questions for the speaker? At times, the uh, uh, professor, uh, at times, the research will give specific elements that contribute to the loss of property value as a result of an adjacent property. Was there any detail in the research about what those qualities or characteristics were that contributed? It's a very detailed and a long research. I pass on those two, actually three articles. The third one is related to register a sexual offender, okay. which will drop the value by 17%. Okay. I pass that information to, uh, to Christina. You okay. are welcome to take a look. Okay, thank you very much. Any other questions? Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker, please. My name is Dennis Murphy. I live at 706 Stonegate Street, which is the house immediately to the east of the house in question. I apologize for squinting. I had eye surgery yesterday. Uh, I have two points. One, what has not been mentioned yet is at the corner of Stonegate and uh, Lawrence Lane, there was an uh, old uh, zoning that allowed that house to be both a residence and a business. And we've already been blindsided when it's been, we've always assumed it was a resident, when uh, this business moved in, didn't tell us anything, and then one day opened full-blown. And now some days you go along there, and there are six or eight cars parked on both sides of the road, plus even on Lawrence Lane. And uh, 
Plus there's a truck parked in the driveway there. Makes it difficult to see. You add some more cars, you don't know how many cars actually come through our neighborhood for no particular reason, often too fast. And one great tragedy is some years back, just a little bit north of us, just north of 14th Street, the next street north of us, a little girl was crossing the street on her tricycle to see her friend and was struck and killed by another vehicle. We have serious concerns about the safety and we have younger families moving into the neighborhood. We're not trying to shut her business down. We just want to keep it within some safe limits. Any questions? Any questions for the speaker, Commissioner Blick? Yes, sir. I have a question. Um, I'm not for sure this this site um, map that it's showing right now, if it's up to date, if it was 2021, do you know when that was? Is that the most recent GIS mapping map? I'm I believe sorry, our I... aerials are from 2022. 2022. So in 2022, that map is probably the most, or that aerial is probably the most up to date. And I'm looking up at it right now, and on that top street, I'm asking you a question. It looks like there's four houses with three cars in those driveways up there. I also see cars down below on the street and it's parked on the street. So is it more of a problem with just having extra cars that what you're saying, or is it more of the amount of cars each house could have? Because I'm seeing quite a bit in that whole area right now. Uh, it depends. Uh, there are people who come and visit and sometimes park on the street. Uh, people have come for piano lessons, uh, any number of things there. But everyone that comes, that's a narrow street. And as I said, you don't really know how many people come through there for, I have no idea why. And they come blasting through. One time I even stepped, I was walking on the yard, I stepped out in the street and physically blocked a car who was speeding and told him, hey, there's little kids in this neighborhood, you know. Be a little, show a little more concern, and all I got for it was an FU and a finger. Gotcha. Thank you. Commissioner Foster, you had a question. Is Lawrence Lane the short connector street between the two? No, Lawrence Lane, uh, actually, I can't see it on this. Let's see it over here. It's the same street. Well, it's the right, It's the other side. All right. It's over here so, south. so that's the street where there is. Is there a current business operating in a house on that street? It is at the corner of Stonegate. Please go back to the mic. Yeah. So, yes. Can you go back to the mic so the persons who are... I apologize. That's right. We'll let... Um, the, uh, the place operating as a business, can you tell us where that is relative to your home? It's, uh, let's see, what is it, four or five houses down west of me. It is the last house on the west end, uh, northwest end of Stonegate Street. I'll show you. Okay. This is his home. Okay. This is the business in... in okay. Right. And that's... Lawrence Lane. Lawrence Lane. Lawrence Lane. Yes. Okay. Lawrence Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions for the speaker? Commissioner Williams Bay, I believe, had to leave the meeting. So please mark attendance accordingly. Oh, he's back. Commissioner Williams Bay, did you have a question for the speaker? No, it was answered. Okay, it was answered. Okay, thank you. Right. Uh, next speaker, please. Ms. Fox, this is Joe Johnson. I join at the start of this item. Okay, thank you, Joe. Hi, my name is Marilyn Wells, and I live at 7003 East Timberon Lane. We are the back, na back door neighbor, which puts us directly to the north, uh, to the property in question. Okay. One of the things I'd like to highlight, even though you've been looking at this map, this is a small neighborhood. We only are 33 households. It doesn't go beyond that as a neighborhood, as far as direct connection with anyone else. So let's take a look here a little closer. 
And Marilyn, we need you to use, there is a mouse that would allow you to point to the screen and that allows people participating virtually to hear you because without the microphone, we literally cannot. So did you find the mouse? I get it. Okay, awesome, thank okay. you. All right, so um, where I have the, the arrow right now, that is the far north west home. You follow it all the way around. That's the outs, outs, outer side of the neighborhood. This is Lawrence Lane, and then there is the, I call it the creek, you know, it's the waterway. Okay, there's, there's no connection to these properties over here, okay? Okay. This is the inside of the horse, I didn't call it, but it's a horseshoe, okay? Here are the inside property, excuse me. Here are the <laughs> inside properties right here, okay? And this is where we are. Okay, at no time have we had any communication from the property owner in regards to this. And I can tell you firsthand, there are many neighbors that never had any communication whatsoever in regards to this neighborhood. Okay. One other thing I'd like to point out, because this speaks to communications and, uh, uh, and uh, following the rules, uh, the, there were two de uh, ap development application signs posted, but were removed uh, this Sunday evening. My understanding is they should have been there till yesterday. Okay. Okay. I have put in a call to the zoning enforcement. I have not heard a call back in regards to that and what the, has been parking violations uh, since she's been operating this home. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Any questions for the speaker? Commissioner Blick? Uh, if you'd remain at the podium for sure. questions, yep. Commissioner Sorry. Blake. Um, you were talking about your area. It's pretty small. Are you guys part of an HOA or neighborhood association? No, we are not. Uh, there has been some review of the original platting and all, that there was a covenant. Um, but I have inquired about that. Even if there is an active covenant, um, that is a civil matter. And you answer my second question. Thank you. As okay. I just wanted to see if you had a covenant or if you're more worried about more yeah. of the, this, yeah. the city's policy on parking for houses. Cool. We're very yeah. worried about the safety of our uh, people that live there, especially the children, especially the children. And we have Coleman Middle School students running down that Stonegate uh, street, and they walk in the street. Okay. Um, Commissioner Hartman. Uh, exactly what parking violations are you referring to? Well, they weren't using the garage, and they were, and there was many as six cars in the in the driveway, which also blocked the sidewalk. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. My name is Philip Frangenberg, 6912 East Stonegate. Um, I'm approximately two houses from uh, 7000 East Stonegate. Uh, the point I want to talk about is, can we have the slide move to the aerial view um, of the houses in the neighborhood? Thank you. So uh, between, I've got to make sure I find it correctly. Uh, where my mouse is at right here, traveling from east on Governor through the neighborhood, there is a pass-through, which is a sidewalk. And that sidewalk is used basically on a daily basis by students who are exiting Coleman Middle School. And what happens is, uh, instead of using sidewalk based on the condition of the sidewalk or whatever they choose to do, they do happen to walk down the middle of our street on Stonegate. And uh, it is obviously a big concern with increased traffic with that many people in that house that those children are going to be at risk of not being seen at those times because of the excess traffic. And I want to bring that, I know that she mentioned it, but I want to make sure that I bring that forward and say that we have excessive uh, walkthrough in our, uh, on, Stone on Stonegate Street itself during the days. Thank you. Any questions for the speaker? 
Thank you. Any other speakers in the room, in chambers, that would like to speak on this topic? Then I'd call for anyone participating virtually who would like to speak on this topic. Okay, with that, we would call then uh, the applicant back to the podium, and you have two minutes to respond to the concerns that you've heard. In regards to the increase in traffic, I believe that has already been addressed and is due to Golden Boomers, um, the other businesses that operate in the neighborhood that come through and has nothing to do with my residence. I have five women living in the home. Um, that's probably the number that would be living there anyways. Um, drop in property values, again, that could happen due to having a very large bus that's parked there with the Golden Boomers that has large signage on it that says Golden Boomers right as you enter the neighborhood. Um, and regardless, my house isn't leaving. So I, yeah, I am very sorry if it affects property values, but we're, we're going to be staying there with eight people. Um, even if this does not pass. Um, I find it offensive that the idea that um, low income equals poor driving skills, um, because it quite feels like that's been insinuated um, at the other meeting as well. Um, the reason for the signs being pulled from the yard, and I communicated this with WPD and with um, uh, MAP, MAP um, on Con 202311 um, and on 10, people began yelling things to my residents um, and that everyone in each home is recovering from trauma and it became began to feel quite dangerous for them to have those signs in their yards. Um, it was already people would drive by and slow down and point. Um, and I had initially brought this up when I was given the signs to post that this could be a contentious issue, um, but was told I had to post them. I could finish, but up to you. Any additional questions, Commissioner Aldrich? Yeah, uh, Ma'am, you made a statement just a second ago that low income uh, and driving skills, I never heard yeah. any mention of that whatsoever. So I don't know why, why you made that statement. It wasn't, nobody in here said that. Okay, it's the increase in driving. Or that a women's house will cause problems with the sewer system, but. <laughs> I just had five girls extra living in my house, and yeah, sewer system was impacted, but. Regardless, um, yeah, that's, um, my, that's my problem and something that um, I would take care of. One thing I heard you say this time is that there are five women living in the house, but earlier I understood you say there were 10 people living in the house. So right now, how many people are living in the house? No, there are five women okay. in this house. In this house, okay. Okay. I was making a request for, for and legally there could okay. only be eight. Okay. As it stands with zoning. Okay. Commissioner Hartman? So is your request still 15? No. What is your request? My request is that a maximum number of 12 people live in the home. Including staff members. Yes. Okay. Any other questions for the speaker? Okay. Thank you. Uh, we'll bring this now back to the commission. And we do have two separate cases. Uh, recalling that the recommendation on this case is for denial. So where are we at? Commissioner Foster? I understand the concerns about traffic. Uh, I live in Delano in a neighborhood with a middle school one block to my east and a Catholic school one block to my west, and there are children and traffic mixing all the time on my side street. But we are talking about a change between eight people that are already approved and 12 people, four additional human beings. I don't think that's going to be a significant enough change in traffic or utility use to um, to address some of the, respond to some of the issues that were brought up. 
I just don't think that they're realistic uh, concerns. Four more people are not going to make that much of a difference, I don't think. Um, I am inclined, the 15 limit is just the standard definition that goes with group residence limited, but we can change the conditions of a conditional use the way we think appropriate, and I would be inclined to change this condition to a maximum of 12, um, which I think is reasonable. Oh, that's not a motion, that's a discussion. I have to always <laughs> make this clear to people. I'm always thinking someone else might want to speak up as well, you know? Mr. Warren, you have a question? I would make a motion that we approve with the change to the conditions that staff put down from a maximum of 15 down to a maximum of 12. Second. I have a motion from Commissioner Warren and a second from Commissioner Blick. A substitute um, motion. Substitute motion is being offered by Commissioner Aldrich. My concerns is that there's five people that are residing in there now. And now you're wanting to double that. Uh, and even though I granted there's, you can do up by, by eight right now, but there's only five people. And you have, uh, you want to go up to 12, including staff, that's more than doubling uh, the occupancy and in with all the concerns and issues, the traffic, the parking uh, that they're facing now with just five, you know, that's going to be a significant increase. So I would like to make a substitute motion uh, that uh, based on staff recommendations and comments uh, that this be uh, uh, denied. I'll second that. I have a substitute motion from Commissioner Aldrich and a second from Commissioner Hartman to approve the staff recommendation for denial and to keep the um, occupancy at the current eight for group residents. So uh, further discussion before we call for a vote? Uh, let's do a roll call vote then on the demotion the motion to approve denial. The substitute we, is, motion. Is, is to approve denial, is that a yes um, is to deny and a no or the other way oh, around? Oh, please help us on that to, one. Uh, approve yeah. the staff recommendation. Approve the staff recommendation. Is that your motion, Commissioner Aldrich? Yes, I want to uphold what staff is recommending denial. So a yes vote means denying the request for expansion of the occupancy. And so we'll begin the roll call vote. Fox. Um, this is a tough one for me because I know that there are citizens at every level of the spectrum really fighting substance abuse. At the same time, I find uh, the number of persons in a residential used to be difficult. So my vote is yes to deny. Dual. Yes. McKay. No. Green. No. Bill Johnson is absent. Blick. No. Nix. No. Foster. No. Warren. No. Joe Johnson. Yes. Miles. No. Hartman. Yes. Aldridge. Yes. Williams Bay. Yes. Five. S motion fails six to seven. Okay, so we'll return to the original motion, which Commissioner Foster was to. Oh, oh, Commissioner Warren, do you care to restate your motion, or can we have it read back? Uh, would be to uh, approve the request uh, with the change of the maximum number of uh, occupants to be reduced from 15 to 12 and uh, approve the remaining conditions as, as put on staff on the alternate action. Okay, we have a motion from Commissioner Warren. The second was from Commissioner Blick. 
Um, a roll call vote, please. So this time, a yes is to approve the, con the group plus home. Okay. Fox. No. Duel. No. McKay. Yes. Green. Aye. Bill Johnson is absent. Blick? Yes. Nix? Yes. Foster? Yes. Warren? Yes. Joe Johnson? Yes. Miles? Yes. Hartman? No. Aldrich? No. Williams Bay? No. To five. With that, the applicant's request is approved. The vote's eight to five. Um, I thank those of you who came to testify today. This is a very personal and difficult situation. I would also say that some incredible healing can happen when neighborhoods pull together for the people in their neighborhood, regardless of who those people are. Um, the relationships going forward could make a huge difference for all of you. So thank you again for your testimony and we appreciate you accepting this decision as we move forward. Next case, pardon me, Commissioner Johnson. Yeah, didn't we approve less than, than was requested? Yes, we did approve less than was requested, yes. 12 rather than the original 15. Yeah, thank you. And that's what the DAB also approved in their review of that's this correct. okay, of this case. Okay, thank you. Um, next case, conditional use 2023 000 11. Um, Christina, would you give us the staff report on this case, please? Sure thing. The applicant is requesting a conditional use for group residence limited in an SF5 single family residential district at 6227 East 17th Street North. Uh, this is the same applicant as CON 2310, so I won't go over a lot of the details that I uh, spoke about in the last um, presentation. Um, the site plan here submitted by the applicant shows a two car garage and a driveway with four parking spaces. Um, they have also Maybe submitted. Let's sorry. give us a minute to clear the room sure. and then, so that we, as we have people crossing you. Okay, thank you, Christina, if you want to proceed. Sure, should I start over or should I just keep going? I think okay. continue from where you were. So the applicant has submitted another administrative adjustment for this property to allow parking within the driveway as long as it's not eight feet from the setback. Um, one thing I would like to point out about this property is that it is directly behind the Redwood Trail. So uh, people living within the facility can walk or bike um, and it's right in their backyard. Um, if you also look at the Wichita Transit, they provide regular bus service along two stops. There's one one half mile to the north along West 21st Street and North Farmstead Street, as well as one half mile to the south along West 13th Street and North Woodlawn Boulevard. Although with the Red Bud Trail there, it's a lot easier to make those shortcuts if you need to. The conditional use request is in conformance with the Community Investments Plan. The 2035 Wichita uh, future growth concept map identifies the site as residential, which reflects the full diversity of residential development and densities found in an urban municipality. The requested conditional use is also in conformance with the Wichita Places for People plan. I mentioned uh, strategy five in the last report, um, providing a diversity of housing options to attract new residents and allow existing residents to remain in the established central area. However, if you look at this aerial, it is right next to an arterial. Um, it's easier for traffic to flow to and from the site. Um, so that's why we have a different recommendation for this particular property. And they're also not looking to make any improvements to this property. Uh, so it uh, satisfies a Wichita Places for People Plan's uh, current condition. Uh, the site is being used as a sober living home and the structure retains the character of the surrounding residential neighborhood. 
Based on the information available prior to the public hearing, MAPD staff recommends that the application be approved subject to the following conditions. One, the conditional use approval is limited to a maximum of 15 persons, including staff. Two, uh, they have to submit a revised site plan that goes hand in hand with the administrative adjustment that I mentioned earlier. Uh, three, no signs shall be allowed except those permitted under the city sign code. Four, uh, the site shall be developed and operated in compliance with all federal, state, and local regulations. And lastly, if the zoning administrator finds that there is a violation of any of these uh, rules in the conditional use, they can declare the conditional use null and void. This went to the DAB um, on May 1st, District 1, and they approved with the condition that the max is 11, including staff. Um, I have received some phone calls, I'm just generally concerned. Um, one person did speak at the DAB, and she said that her, her neighbors were also concerned about um, the group residence limited. And let's go through the site photos here. So this is looking south towards the site. Sorry, it's a little lagged on my part. This is looking north away from the site. This is looking east away from the site. This is looking towards Woodlawn Boulevard. And lastly, this is looking west away from the site. And with that, I will stand for questions. Questions for staff, Commissioner Gr Warren? <laughs> I just stuttered just to get a smile. When, when uh, we come up with recommendations of 15, is that just the maximum for the, that is a blanket for this type of yeah, deal? Yeah, that's, what that's what's allowed in the Unified Zone. So it has code. nothing to do with square footage or number of bedrooms or anything like no. that? So, okay. Do you know the square footage of this particular property? Not off is the it, top of my okay. head. I'm sure smaller the than the previous commissioner Aldrich uh, yes on the available parking is this a two-car garage or three-car garage? it is a two-car garage so now you have less available parking space than what would you would on the other case we just got done hearing um, but yet the recommendation is up to 15 so now you're gonna have more cars that are gonna have a tougher time to find a Parking, yes, right? but we did we did take public transportation and walking trails into consideration when we uh, analyzed this site. Uh, it's closer to public happen. transportation and walking trails, which is an option. But if every resident has a vehicle, then you're going to wind up having a parking issue. Commissioner Williams Bay. Yes. Did you say that DAB rec recommended 11 parking spaces? I mean, 11 occupants? 11 occupants, yes. Including one staff. No, including one staff. So it, so 10 residents. Plus one. Plus one staff. Okay. Other questions for staff at this time? Okay. Then we would call the applicant forward. Do you want me to go through it all again? Hello, my name is. Tell us, we do, do you need to state your name and address okay. for the record? Hello, my name is Ivory Kaufman. I live at 4848 North Wyndham Road, Wichita, Kansas, 67219. Uh, my business is Ivy Home Foundation. I am the owner and operator. Um, this home is at 6227 East 17th Street North. I love this house. One thing about me, and I forgot to mention with my sober homes, is I only buy homes that I would live in with my family and feel safe in. And if I could have five more homes just like this one, it fits every criteria to a T. Um, it's access to transportation. It backs up to the Redbud Trail. It's gorgeous. I love it. Um, my kids love it too. It's very cool inside. Um, so she mentioned several of the features, um, but my residents love the trail, use it, um, and it's, it's a very peaceful, peaceful place to live. Um, it has eight men living in it now. Uh, and I have applicants who would like to move in. Um, you've heard, I think, most of the rest of it. In regards to parking, we have applied um, for, uh, we filled in, what is that called? An administrative adjustment. adjustment thank you. 
um, and have plans in for putting in a parking, a single parking stall right here that would still fit in the area that's ours, not the city's, um, and allow for one more stall right here. Strange thing about men in Wichita in this demographic, many of them don't have cars. Cannot explain why. Um, and whether, and use Again, public transportation, share rides amongst each other, or get a ride to and from with friends. Or um, one guy who just moved in has a motorcycle, parks it over here, or they park their bikes in the back in the um, shed that we have back there. Um, but yeah, this house is just fantastic because the Redbed Trail also goes over to WSU and then on down to WSU Tech. I love this one. Um, I'm trying to think if there's anything else that I didn't cover before. Uh, let's see, when parking came up with the neighborhood, um, we also discussed how close we are to Woodlawn um, and making sure to make all attempts. There's a, if we go back to the overview, the bird's eye view of the, can I do that or do you guys do that? I think Ty Ben can move the slide back to the, there we go. So there is also this street here um, that could allow us to keep more parking off of there if it so happens that we end up with a lot of cars in the house. Um, because we definitely, I, I do not want people to start parking up here close to the stop sign. I just think that creates a hazard. Okay. And, and people follow the rules of the house or I evict them. So if I tell them not to park there, they won't. Any questions for the speaker? Uh, Commissioner Warren. I'm not looking for an exact answer because it's going to change, but on, on average, how many of your uh, residents or clients uh, don't drive because of uh, DUIs or loss, loss of rights? Right now, zero. Cannot say that that's true in the future. But yeah, some of them pick the house because it's close to where they work. Um, yeah. OK. Commissioner Hartman had a question. I was curious, how many square feet in this house? 3,400 square feet. Five bedroom, three bath, 3,400 square feet, three living rooms, washer dryer on site. And the men keep the house immaculate. It is crazy. You just, you wouldn't expect it. I don't think you'd expect that walking into a lot of the men's houses, but the lead and the second in this house, they're just, they're OCD about it, and they, yeah, immaculate. Commissioner Williams Bay, did you have a question? Answered. Commissioner Foster? This uh, per, would permit up to 15 persons. Is that how many you prefer, or again, no. are you going to go for the two per bedroom, 10 max? I, so um, one other thing about me, and this is, I've been doing residential and commercial real estate. It's a family thing since I was five, and I will not put someone in a room that does not have an egress window. Um, this house, another reason why I love it, is when it had foundation repair made, they put egress window in almost every room downstairs. Um, so it has another great room downstairs with two large egress windows so it could work as a six bedroom. I haven't put up a wall there. I really don't want to. I find that kind of trashy. Um, and that's not even the third living room. If I included that room and called it a living room, it would be four living rooms in the house. So it truly can house 12 people with them each having their own with two people to a bedroom. You would be comfortable with a maximum of 12 as opposed to 15? Yes. I will not put 15 in a house. All right. Thank That's you. just, yeah. Okay. Commissioner Hartman? One other question, or a couple. How long has this been a uh, group home? January. Since January. January 1st, I believe. I'd have to check my records, but January. And has this uh, property had any violations? No. The police have never been called. 
And I failed to ask this of the last case, but I want to ask it. Are there any sexual predators ever accepted into your group living arrangements? Yes. Okay. I and you follow the regulations for notification of neighbors in those instances? So every SO, every sex offender registers. Okay. Um, With their address. And I have a system where I um, have their parole officer's phone number. And we communicate on a regular basis, and I do, we do weekly UAs, random UAs. There's a whole system of accountability. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Then uh, Commissioner Dole. Dole? Yes, I may have missed in your original uh, presentation, but uh, what, if any, formal training did you have to run this kind of business? Formal, are you recur are you saying in regards to being a landlord or in? Well, it's kind of a special landlord. I mean, maybe there's no there's training no required for this. I'm just asking. Yeah, so in the state of Kansas, anyone can open a sober house. And there's no licensing. There's no um, whatsoever. My training I guess you would say, would be as um, I have owned real estate, um, a residential and commercial real estate. I opened my first business at 16, and then to become, and also been a property manager, um, and then to learn to do this, um, I there's no class you can take. Um, the people who operate them are... They open and they learn as they go. And so before I opened it, I traveled to multiple places and found the ones who I like what they're doing. I think they are doing it well and put myself as a student underneath them. Does that answer your question? Okay, thank you. Commissioner Aldrich? So what you're saying is that there's no state statutes that regulate or control or have any input whatsoever on the type of work that you're doing? No, it's a little scary. That's a lot scary. Yeah, because there's, well, sorry, I won't start. <laughs> yeah. Okay. There's no regulation whatsoever on sober homes. Okay, any other questions at this point? Um, uh, next, is there anyone in chambers who would like to speak on this item? Seeing none, is there anyone participating virtually who would like to speak on this item? Okay, we'll bring this back then to hearing none. We'll bring this back to the commission. Commissioner Foster. This time I will make it a motion. I would like to move that we approve per staff conditions with the exception that of condition one, we change the maximum number of persons from 15 to 12. Second. We have a motion and a second. Does, any discussion? I just have a discussion. I just have a question for staff real quick. Do you know if this location is in a HOA or a neighbor association? And do they have a covenants or anything? Um, not to my recollection, but that is a civil matter. So, yeah. I was just wondering if, if not, if there was no, any parking we, requirements or not. So. When we do the review of the ownership right. list. We also look for any neighborhood associations that are established that we can notify the neighborhood association. And I don't believe this one had an established neighborhood association. Sounds great. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, let's go to a roll call vote. Oh, a roll call vote. Commissioner Fox. No. Commissioner Duell. No. Commissioner McKay. Yes. Green. Yes. Bill Johnson absent. Blick? Yes. Nix? Yes. Foster? Yes. Warren? Yes. Joe Johnson? Yes. Miles? Yes. Hartman? Yes. Aldrich? No. Williams Bay? No. Motion passes. Nine to, nine to five. Four. Nine to four. Nine to four. Motion passes nine to four. Thank you.
all participating. That brings us to case 4.7. Um, if we could have the staff report, please, Aaron, I believe. Good afternoon, Aaron Ebach with the Planning Department. This is a request uh, to um, change the zoning on a property from SF5 single family residential district to LI limited industrial district. The application area in this case is 0.35 acres um, and it, that is the north portion of a greater 1.2 acre property. Uh, you can see here on the map that the south portion of the property is already zoned LI light industrial. Um, that change actually happened in 1959. At that time, the district was called the E industrial district, but by um, today's code standards is equivalent to the LI limited industrial district. The property is currently used as vehicle storage and warehousing. And a complaint was called into zoning enforcement uh, stating that the SF5 portion of the property um, had started being used for the uh, industrial operations of the site uh, that was permitted to the, um, only to the south. So the applicant ultimately is seeking to rezone the remainder of the property um, to bring the entire thing into compliance and to be able to use the whole site for their business. Um, as you see here on the zoning map, the entire property is surrounded by SF5 single family residential district zoning. To the north and west is the Rivendale addition, which is currently being, um, the process of being developed with single family residences. To the south, there are properties developed with single family residences and manufactured homes. And then east of the site is also a, a property developed with a single family home. There are some commercial properties in this area um, that you can see on the map. Uh, those are located closer to the intersection um, of 55th Street and Hydraulic. Um, and then actually, if you go even further down to the south and the north a little bit, there are, so again, some industrial properties um, on the arterial. Due to the residential zoning surrounding the property, this site um, will need to comply with both um, compatibility, setback, and height standards as well as um, coming into compliance with screening, lighting, and landscape standards uh, per the Unified Zoning Code. There is a uh, screening, or there's a fence um, currently on the property, and I can show you all that that looks like in the site photos. The applicant has indicated, or did indicate at the DAB meeting that that has since been upgraded, so I will let them speak to what the current condition is um, of the fence. The Proposed zone change is in partial conformance with both the Community Investments Plan and the South Wichita Hayesville area plan. Both of the uh, con land use concept maps for these plans designate this area as appropriate for residential land uses. Um, so it is in non-conformance with those maps in both plans. However, um, it is found to be in partial conformance with the locational guidelines of the Community Investments Plan and the South Wichita Hayesville area plan does indicate um, a desire for new commercial development in the area and um, sites that this area where there is currently this existing commercial and industrial development be appropriate um, for those future land uses. So it is in close proximity to um, an area in which the Hayesville area plan uh, recommends that use. DAB heard this case on May the 3rd, and they voted to approve 7 to 0. And I will go through the site photos and then um, address any questions you may have. So you can see here, this is, again, that gate that I mentioned. Um, it's my understanding this has since been updated. See, this is the residence east of the subject site. Um, south of the subject site. Again, south of the subject site. Here again, you can see some of the uh, previously installed screening. And then again, screening there. Um, with that, I'm glad to answer any questions you may have. Any questions for staff? Commissioner Aldrich. Uh, 
do you know whether the screening uh, around the entire property, including what the property that we're talking about right now, the section, is that all screened in right now presently? You know, I don't know. I can't, I couldn't get back there to take the site photos. They are required, though, to bring the entire site into um, conformance with the landscape ordinance and the zoning code. So upon approval of this request, they would be required to install both the screening fence and as well as a landscape buffer in those areas. Well, thank you. Okay. Any other questions think, for staff at I this time? I, I think I only want to, I want to ask a question uh, regarding the, the conformance of the screening because this place has sat here for, I mean, it apparently was rezoned in what, 1959? And it's sat there for probably the last 10 years and been non-compliant with screening. And I, I can assure you that because I drive by there, this is very close to my house several times a week, no change has been made in the screening. So what is gonna assure that if this is approved, to expand what they're storing on this property, which is a bunch of dead equipment, they've stored it there for years, that they're actually going to be in compliance with putting up proper screening. Um, I would defer to JR to respond to that question. I would say that we would respond on a complaint basis. Obviously, this is a case in front of the, the commission, so we are aware of it, and we would probably do our best to make sure that it gets done. However, we do not have the ability to monitor every conditional use or zone change, obviously. So we would rely on a complaint and I would think there could be some from the surrounding, particularly to the, the west, northwest, um, if that doesn't happen. Okay, yeah, because somebody's just taken some property, put some inadequate screening around it, stored dead equipment there right in between two residences and they've, they've done it for a year. Weeds have grown up and everything. It it's, looks terrible. Okay, any other questions at this point? Then we would ask for the applicant, please, to come forward, state your name and address, and you have 10 minutes to tell us about your project. Uh, hello, everybody. My name is uh, Luis David Alvarado, and I'm the owner of JNS Underground. I recently bought the property about a year ago, and um, I know that there, on the previous hearing, we had the same, uh, everybody brought it, brought it out that there was a lot of dead equipment parked out there. Um, we're a small business, and we're just trying to use all this space, but we do move all of, all of our equipment and store at that uh, property. So you're, so there's abandoned vehicles or non-working vehicles there at this moment? There was, uh, the previous owner had a bunch of, uh, he, used, he used to work on the oil fields, uh, went, but he had all his equipment there, but he had, he moved everything out. Everything that, that is in there, it's, uh, it's been in use. It's not like that equipment or anything like that. Okay, and what's your plan for the screening to? Oh, uh, I upgraded. I upgraded the fence. Uh, the fence on the south side of the property, and I am. We're planning on upgrading the the gate. We haven't upgraded the the gate, but we will um, eventually. We're just getting some quotes right now. Commissioner Aldrich. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, so, do you or do you not have screening around the entire property, including? this part of the property now? I have a screening on the, on the south side of the property. I own the property to the east side as well. So we're planning, I have in, uh, the, the east side of the property, it's this, the, we haven't upgraded the screening because we owe the property to the east and we're planning to do a screening on both properties at the same time. Okay, and do you have a time limit when you're no, looking at doing that? I don't have a time right now. So it could be a year, it could be 10 years down the No, it, it, it's going to be within the next year. Uh, additional, uh, Philip? I just want to make a clarification that even going to industrial zoning does not allow the storage of wrecking and salvage, so inoperable vehicles would still require a conditional use. They're allowed to store operable vehicles, but wrecking and salvage for inoperable vehicles would not be okay. allowed even with this zone change. Okay. And you're aware that inoperable vehicles cannot be stored there? 
Yes, ma'am. Okay. Commissioner Blick, you have a question? So I just want to verify. So this photo that's being presented to us, that has completely changed. All of those are gone. Uh, there, uh, there's one more that I'm still pushing him to get it out. Uh, I've been trying to get him out for the past, since we bought it for, for over a year, and he's saying that he's going to move it eventually. Uh, but all of the equipment that is parked there that belongs to me, it's operable. I mean, there's not a junk or anything parked on the property. Thank you. Okay, other questions for the applicant? Is Commissioner Aldrich. Yeah, you just said something that they're all repairable. Are every single one of the vehicles operational? No, right they're now? operable. Yeah, they, they're move. Operable. They're movable vehicles. Operable. Okay. Operable. Okay. And you said that you have replaced the south fence, but we just heard a commissioner say she hasn't seen anything this, change. This side, of, this side of the fence has been um, upgraded over here. About the property in question, which is outlined in red. It's that's one the whole part. property. It's one. Uh, it's the same property. Okay, so you there's no new fence down. There's no below. access. There, the only access to this property is through here. Okay. So you're going to screen that whole section, not just the red area. Correct, because okay. this, there's no uh, division in between this property and this one. It's one whole property. It's open. Okay. All right, thank you. Any other questions? Is there anyone in chambers who would like to speak on this item? Yes, sir. Uh, we, this is public comment. So thank you, sir. Please remain, and then uh, you'll listen to public comment and can respond to any other concerns that are raised. Okay. Ne first speaker, please. Lonnie Barnes, 2924 North Terrace Drive, Wichita, Kansas. Uh, mine is more for clarity. Can you go back to that screening that was shown here with the black mesh? Type it, there we go. Okay. <clears throat> so for a point of clarity, even for myself, when, when uh, the ordinance said you have to put up a screening uh, between residential and this portion here, I have the same question in here because uh, this group here voted to uh, allow a screening between a, a parking lot and my residence is only about 10 foot away. And that was screening is to stop, I guess, people from looking directly into my property and, and light shining directly into me. Is this, is this acceptable for screening? JR, can you answer that for us today? I will. Yes, it is not. It is not. So, I guess I'm, I'm asking, what is acceptable for screening? Is that a privacy fence, wood, what? Where solid screening is required, wood could be acceptable. Um, masonry, concrete, brick, block, any number of things, but that would, what's there would not be sufficient. Okay. Just, okay. Any other comment? No, I just okay. want to point of clarity because I've yet to see the screening that came up three months ago, the requirement to put it between my property and there. And, okay. and so I don't want this to pop up and say that's my screening. Okay, thank you, Lonnie. All right. <laughs> Any other persons who would like to speak on this particular case? Darren Rader, 1301 East 57th Street South, Wichita, Kansas 67216. This property has come a long way. Uh, if you go back to the aerial view, all the abandoned equipment that was mentioned from Miss Miles is now located directly to the west of this property on the residential land that's right next to Laura, which has all been moved to this lot. And if you look at the street view, you can see that they put up a brand new wood fence along the street side, what's hiding all of that abandoned equipment. So I think it's funny that the uh, city zoning inspector says there's never been a complaint. I stood before this commission when we was having another agenda meeting a month ago complaining about this property along with another one that you guys just allowed to be limited and industrial. So this, where this brand new fence is, where that white van, that's where all the abandoned property is now located, next door to this property. That's why they put that brand new fence up. This property that's on question today has, has been cleaned up and a lot of changes have been done. 
which does complement the neighborhood, but I don't know that the the dilapidated fences and and stuff doesn't that need to go from top to bottom to meet the appropriate appropriate fencing classifications. So, you know, with this having two feet on the bottom, two feet on the top, that still is not appropriate. So the the corrections that were made weren't acceptable according to the rules with this. So, uh, you know, I mean, they're, they're making leaps and bounds progresses over there from the previous owner. Uh, that's, that's not what's in question, but what's in question is, is you know, we, we, we've got serious issues down on the south end of this this area that this gentleman's business, he, he works directly for the the individual that we had questions with on the other property. Uh, I have grave concern that there's going to be contaminants dumped on this property like we have documentation of as well. I mean, we're all on city, or we're on uh, well water and septic services. We don't have access to city water. This access on 55th has city water. So they're not affected by what they do to the to the groundwater. Along with the other property that was in question, they both have access to city water to where all the residents down this area does not. So I, I ask that this this commission denies the re request and, and, and I'll personally be making more recommendations to the city zoning department and, and central inspections because I personally complained about it before this meeting and several other times. Okay, thank you for your testimony. Any questions for the speaker? Okay, are there anyone else in chambers who would like to speak on this topic? Is there anyone participating virtually who would like to speak on this matter? I'll bring it back to the uh, we, the applicant. If you would come back and respond to the concerns that you've just heard expressed, you have two minutes. Um, I will bring uh, his question up about the screening facing his uh, property. I didn't. I was not aware that that was in compliance with the city uh, requirements. I will definitely upgrade that uh, fence and. Uh, I do not know of the f gap from the, on his question, on the gap from the two feet gap that I have from the fence above the ground. I don't know if that's required to come all the way from the ground up because there is a two feet uh, ditch that, that you cannot see what's inside the property. Um, so, so what I hear you saying is you did not understand the requirements for the screening and landscaping that are required if this is approved. So could we have clarification of that to make sure there's understanding about what would be expected? No? As far as screening is concerned, it would need to be solid from the ground up to the height, the minimum height. And the minimum height is eight feet? Six, six feet. feet. Okay, six, so It could be eight feet, but six would be the minimum. Six feet minimum from the ground up. And then there's also landscaping requirements outside of that. For the landscaping, it only applies to the um, portion being rezoned. And that okay. would be a landscape buffer, which the landscape ordinance also says that they can use existing trees. Um, it looks from aerial photographs that there is a fairly good amount of trees on the rear portion of the property. Again, this only applies to the portion being rezoned because the existing LI property that the majority of this site is already zoned was in existence prior to the landscaping ordinance. So just along the west, north, and east boundaries within that red box would have to come into compliance with landscape ordinance, and that's one shade tree per 40 linear feet. Um, they do have the ability to rely on existing vegetation, which it just even from an aerial point of view almost to me, it looks like it would be a compliance. We'd want to see some type of documentation of where those trees are um, so that we have official proof that, yes, there is that landscaping there. Commissioner Blick? Just for clarification, JR, um, the applicant was saying that there's a two foot from the street down into the ditch, and that, but it goes all the way down to the ground. Wherever the fence is, it has to be down to the ground. Yes. Correct. Even Thank if it you, causes JR. drainage issues? I didn't. JR, even if it ca causes drainage issues? 
I don't know that I'm prepared to answer that. I'm not sure I've seen a fence cause a drainage issue, but under the zoning code, solid screening should be solid screening. It should be from the ground to the top of the fence, whatever height that might be. You know, there could be some situations where the fence could be, uh, a fence like this might work, but there might be a berm in front of it. The idea is solid screening. I think at some point here, you could probably look in there and see in. Okay, thank you. This one, this, this, this one is does not, this fence is not down in the ditch. It's up on the level ground. The ditch starts after that. So the having it all the way up to the ground, it's never been all the way to the ground. Um, but it, I can't see that it caused draining problems because it's not down in the ditch. It's on level ground above the ditch. Okay, thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Foster? I actually have a question for the applicant. Do you own the property to the west? I own the property to the east, which is this property. Okay, so you do not own the property to the west where someone has said that all the dead equipment that was on this lot has been moved to the no, lot to the west? Okay. Thank you. Okay. We cleared, we've been through all the testimony. Um, any other questions for the applicant? Uh, bring this back to the commission. What's your? I have a question for staff. Commissioner Aldrich. As Thank you, you can be seated now. Com uh, question for staff, Aaron, are you still here? Yeah, I guess my question is just out of curiosity. Is there a time frame? What, if this is approved, is there a time frame that the applicant has to have the uh, screening uh, completed? There is not. So this is not like a conditional use where you know there are conditions specifically stating that the site the site plan needs to be turned in within a certain period of time. Um, again, I think I would probably defer to Jr.'s previous answer, and that it would be on a complaint basis. So if we realize that they this was approved, and then they had not installed the appropriate screening and landscaping, then we would go from that point. Um, okay, so it could be a year or two years before we get screened. JR? If I may, I think the applicant in the room with us is hearing this conversation. He's aware that that's a violation to not have the screening. So, no, it won't go a year or two. Thank you. Okay. So, Commissioner sorry. Foster? Can I ask for a, a clarification on what happens if we don't approve this? The remaining land to the south is already zoned industrial, so it is going to continue being used the way it's used, basically, correct? That is correct, yes. All right, thank you. Okay. What's your will, Commission? I would move to approve per staff comments. Second. We have a motion to approve. Commissioner Foster, a second from Commissioner Duell. Any further discussion? All in favor of the motion, indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, nay? Nay. Mo was that a nay, or was that, okay. Uh, nay. We have then, there are 12 commissioners present because Commissioner Williams Bay left, so the motion passes 11-1. Thank you. Um, that concludes our public hearing items. Uh, no. It, oh. So we have a department review item 2023 quadruple zero six. This is the um, first part of our addressing of the short term rental program. Um, Scott Wadel will be presenting, and if you'll just note um, what ha we've prior looked at in one fell swoop is being broken into two parts. The first part is the zoning aspect of changes related to short term rentals. And then separately, we'll address um, licensure issues and municipal code related to short-term rentals. We have uh, authority to make a recommendation. Uh, the second part, we can give advice or encouragement to the city council, but they will make the final decisions on municipal code and um, zoning. So that's why we're looking at it in two pieces. So. Here we go, Scott. 
with yeah, item 4.8, the first portion. Sure. Well, thank you very yeah, much. I'd like Thanks. to make a motion that uh, MAPC approve the recommendation of advanced plan. Um, for those of us who aren't on advanced plans, we have no idea what that might be. <laughs> and actually, the motion this morning of advanced plans, Commissioner Duell, was to bring this to the full MAPC for review and discussion and public hearing. Oh, I thought we had... <laughs> I we okay, I have a motion and a second, but, uh, oh, no, no second, okay. Thank you, Commissioner Johnson, for... Seconded. I did second, Ann. Oh, Commissioner Miles seconded, and Commissioner Johnson moved that they accept the recommendation of advanced plans. So, discussion. So, what would be, was there quite a bit of changes that was on the advanced plans that was from what we got presented at the previous. Okay, if we accept this motion that was made from advanced plans, what we approved was to bring it to this commission. And so you can vote on it, but we're still going to hear it. Yes, we it. felt the full commission. I think the advanced plan committee, I listened and it, I understood they believe the full commission should hear some of the public testimony regarding the issues. Does that make sense? Is that so, accurate? So it's south. Oh, we have to vote on the motion. We have to vote okay. For, there's a substitute. The only substitute is the denial, right? Okay. Not to hear it. Wait a minute. I'd like to withdraw my motion. Okay. Thank you. All right, I'll withdraw my second then. Okay, we've withdrawn the motion and the second, and so we will hear this item. Scott, will you proceed with a overview of the short-term rental zoning changes? Uh, Again, you have 10 minutes. Can I, I thought three. Scott, uh, have we handed out the stuff you gave us this morning? Um, no, sir. What we've got is we do have a... Uh, We've got a one, well, we've got two things. Number one is we have a staff report for the zoning and the MAPC policy. There was a, it's one staff report for those two items. And then we have a separate staff report, which is for the licensing and the nuisance party houses, which is the second one. And then there is a third one, which there was a handout that was done, presented for uh, advanced plans. I don't know that it was created for this one. So I'm going to look to Philip and ask if he can just run some quick copies on this one. And what it does is it's a summary of the changes that have occurred since uh, the MAPC meeting a couple weeks ago. So we'll get that distributed out for you all. The, the reason why it was, the motion was made this morning is because we did have some changes, regardless of how my, many of them might be in. Mm -hmm. But uh, and then these, these folks haven't gotten People who weren't there haven't got any of their paperwork to be able to even study it and then you're asking to make an appointment make a, a, a motion to approve or disapprove well the um and i can't speak to the motion but in terms of the materials that were distributed it's true they were distributed after the packets were mailed out initially we uh those are the two agenda items that you should have received at least electronically um there, i and i saw that there are some paper versions so i assume that those got distributed as well and I'm more than happy to take you through. Yeah. No, um, I think it was maybe Monday. I think it was I think Monday we, that we sent. We got out. the electronic copies. Mm -hmm. I did have a I did have a question on those electronic copies. There were okay. um, there were items that were highlighted in yellow. Not yes. Question and answers, but on the on the. In the zoning portion and yes. also in the licensing. And those are, in the licensing, those are highlighted changes that occurred since uh, the last. MAPC meeting last week. So for the zoning ones, uh, JR, those highlights were a working copy. So it's a way of, that we're track changes over time. So not necessarily changes that occurred since the last MAPC meeting, but changes that have occurred over time with the document. The the summary page will be very helpful. Yeah, and, and I'm more than happy to walk you through that. And, you know, if it, at the end of this, uh, if you choose to continue and receive the presentation, at the end of it, if you, 
if you don't feel comfortable, you don't feel like you've gotten the correct, the information that you need to make a decision, you can always defer it. You've always got that option as well. Okay, so I'm a little stuck. Are we gonna wait for the handout so you can quickly see the overview I, of changes since we saw this most recently? I, if, if, it, if it is possible, what I'd like to do is take you through the PowerPoints that, that I have for this particular item, and then I would like to read through the handout with you. I think that the PowerPoint will give you a good background on it, just a refresher on where we've been. The handout then will give you just, we'll go point by point on what some of the changes have been. Okay. Thank you, proceed. Okay, so uh, Ty Ben, if you can pull up that PowerPoint, this is the one for the zoning changes. And uh, while she's doing that, I guess I would just point out that the, oh, there we go. I'll cover that later then. All right, so very good. So again, this one is on the zoning portion. Uh, we'll talk we'll talk more as we go through this PowerPoint about what that entails. Okay, very good. So the recommendation, staff recommendation to the MAPC is that you would take four uh, actions on this one. First one is to initiate the amendment to the Unified Zoning Code, which is required as, in order for an amendment to take place. Number two, that you would approve the proposed uh, code changes, which are detailed in the uh, packet that you received, that you would recommend that the governing bodies adopt those changes as well. And then the fourth one uh, deals not with the zoning code, but with a policy that the MAPC adopted, and that is the policy regarding signage that goes out as part of a development application the public notice signage. And I'll explain that, it's in the PowerPoint, but those are the actions that are recommended for the MAPC to take. So um, this is the overview uh, where we've been. We talked about a lot of these at the last meeting. At the feedback that I received from the MAPC, uh, part of that feedback, what I heard was that um, the, there was a lot of information in the PowerPoint, there was a lot of information in the staff report. So I've tried to really curtail that substantially. So today, uh, I'm not going to go through all of these in depth, but I'm more than happy to answer questions about those if you do have questions. Also, I would refer you to the packet in that the staff report is one, two, three pages long. Uh, there are attachments about the process. There's attachments about existing conditions and regulations. There's the proposed changes, but then by and large, the, the biggest chunk of the packet, both packets, is public comments that have been received to date. So um, in terms of what the issue is, uh, I, I think the, the issue or the challenge that we face as a community is that short-term rentals uh, are operating. They're here in Wichita. There's approximately, by different estimates, 500 to 600 of these operating in Wichita today. Uh, many of them are operating in the areas where uh, it is against the zoning code. Uh, we have a zoning code uh, that did not anticipate short-term rentals. And so uh, they've come about, they exist. The zoning code in most residential districts does not allow for stays less than seven days. And short-term rentals, just by their very nature, are looking for short duration stays most of the time. So. To, uh, to rent one of these or to use one of these for less than uh, seven days is against the zoning code in those residential districts. The other thing that we face too as a community is that uh, we are receiving complaints uh, on occasion about short-term rentals. So uh, this is, uh, I think, the two-part challenge and really trying to determine what's a good fit for Wichita when it comes to, to this new development. See if I can get the slide to advance. Uh, Ty Bing, can you go to the next slide, please? Okay, very good. All right, process to date. Next slide, please. I don't know why it's not working up front. So we've had a, a series of meetings. Uh, this is just a quick summary listing of those. Uh, starting back in 2021, 
uh, all the way through the end of last year, beginning of this year with district advisory board meetings. Next slide, please. And more recently uh, to the advanced plans in March, uh, MAPC in April, where the MAPC, uh, I, really what I heard was it's a lot of information. Let's send it back to advanced plans to give them time to uh, really dig into it. And then uh, we had the advanced plans meeting this morning where they uh, reviewed it, heard public comments, and uh, now it's back to the MAPC. We have the opportunity to take action on it. Certainly not, not required. Next slide, please. In terms of definitions and mission, next slide. So short-term rental, just so everyone's on the same page, we're typically talking about um, a place that is rented out on Airbnb, VRBO, one of those platforms. Uh, so they're typically fully furnished and uh, offered through these online um, platforms. Next slide, please. Uh, I think that this has been an especially robust uh, community conversation because it touches on, for the city of Wichita, it touches on uh, a number of things that come up in our mission statement, which is keeping residents safe, growing the economy, dependable infrastructure and services, and providing conditions for living well. And I think it touches on all of those in a variety of different ways. And I think that there are a variety of different perspectives on how, how it does touch those. So I think that's why this has been especially robust. Next slide, please. So in terms of the proposed regulations, again, uh, passing over what our existing ones are, which are in the packet. So there are four things, four elements uh, that we're recommending changes to. Uh, the Unified Zoning Code, to uh, creating a licensing program, to changes to the Municipal Code regarding uh, nuisance party houses, and then also a change to the MAPC policy number 20, which is regarding the development application signs. So those four elements are recommended for changes. Next slide. Out of those, uh, right now for this item, we're just talking about the two. We're concentrating on the zoning code and the policy. Next slide. So in terms of the zoning code changes, they would apply only to the city of Wichita, not to Sedgwick County. Sedgwick County would still have the limitation on seven day stays. Um, also, uh, whether or not they're allowed in the process to approve them uh, will depend on where they're located and what zoning district. And we'll talk more about that. Next slide. So in our 21 zoning districts, there are five uh, that are identified in the proposed zoning change where short-term rentals would uh, need to receive an administrative permit or zone, uh, zoning permission in order to operate. Next slide. So you can see that those are SF10 through MF29, and they're listed here on this table. Now, in all of these uh, situations, if a property is owner-occupied and operated as a short-term rental, so say uh, the owner, it's a, it's a, um, it's say that it's a, it's a single-family house and it has an accessory dwelling unit in the backyard, and the owner is on the property, occupies that property while they're using it as a short-term rental they would not need any changes to the zoning, no administrative permit or anything. It would be allowed by right. And we're doing that based on public comment and feedback that we heard that there's, there seemed to be a consensus that people felt like that was not going to be an issue, that the owner was going to keep, keep things uh, operating well. If it's, in, uh, if it's outside of one of these five zoning districts and it is not owner-occupied, it would still be allowed by right. So if it's in a commercial zoning district or another not one of these not these five zoning districts, it's allowed by right. But if it's in one of these five zoning districts and it is not owner occupied, then they would need to come and request an administrative permit in order to be in compliance with zoning. And you may have heard about administrative permits. They already exist but they're only currently used for wireless communication towers. So we are expanding that to include short-term rentals as part of the change. Next slide. So in terms of definitions, there would be a new definition created for short-term rentals. It would include bed and breakfast because they're fairly similar uses. It would not include a group residence or what we've talked about today as part of the zoning cases. Yes, I saw some eyebrows rise, but no, it would not include those. 
nor would it include hotel or motel. So you could not open a day's in if you received permit, the administrative permit for a short-term rental. Next slide. Now, uh, it would not allow uh, for a short-term rental to be operated out of a recreational vehicle, so you can't have an RV parked out there. Uh, even though Airstreams are very cool, uh, you could, would not be able to do that. Um, you would have to be licensed with the city, and that's a whole other one that we'll be talking about with the next item. Uh, you would need to be in compliance with the various codes that are in effect for properties. Next slide. Now, um, how we would do this is we would do it through an administrative permit. One of the reasons why we're proposing an administrative permit and what for this particular use is because, again, the quantity between 500 and 600, we want to provide an opportunity to sift through which ones are controversial and which ones are not controversial. And we'll talk a little bit about how that happens. But the ones that are not controversial, we're proposing that we would approve those administratively so they would never come, they would not come before the MAPC and they would not go before the DAB or the city council. They would be approved in the planning department. That's for the non-controversial ones. For the ones that are controversial, they would convert to a conditional use. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. So there would be a, a more of a standardized zoning process for those. Um, so in terms of uh, if someone wants to operate a short-term rental at their property, uh, they would need to make an application for an administrative permit through the planning department. As part of that application, uh, there would be a notice that would go from the planning department and be mailed out to the property owners of all the abutting and contiguous land around that particular parcel. And as part of that, that would be the only public notification that would take place. There would not be a sign is what we're proposing. And the reason why we're proposing the change to your policy, that you would change your policy, is because we've heard from short-term rental owners and operators uh, concerns about uh, that, you know, they have a fully furnished uh, residence, that it's not always occupied, and that it would be vulnerable to theft or break-ins. And so uh, they've requested that the sign not be required. Now, if the case uh, is controversial, uh, then they would go through the conditional use process. If they go through the conditional use process, the sign would still be required for that process. The change to policy number 20 is only for the administrative permit for short-term rentals, not to conditional uses or other zoning district changes. So next slide. I just have a quick question. Yes, sir. Um, so I know that when notifications go out, there's property owners that, that are renters that yes. live in those houses. So yep. when you send them out, it could go to California and it never gets back to the person that that's actually living beside. Have Correct. you guys ever thought about sending one to the actual address also? We have. Um, that has come up as part of advanced plans discussions. Um, it's not been on a recent agenda. I think it's been a couple months since that discussion has come up. Uh, but that's been a discussion not just, uh, not in particular for short-term rentals, but rather for all zoning uh, notifications. So uh, that conversation is not carried forward, but I do want to let you know that that conversation has been happening. Yep. Commissioner Aldrich has a question to you at this point. Yes, sir. Yeah, Scott, would you, I'm curious on that number of 50% of the owners. Uh -huh. Why is it 50%? Why is it not? 40% or 30%? Sure. Um, well, it, at this point, uh, that was a question, a discussion that happened at, uh, in staff meetings. We felt like 50% showed that there's, of course, a majority of the property owners who uh, either are concerned about it or not in agreement with it. So simply because of the fact that it gets to a, a simple majority. Uh, that's why we established it at that percentage. Uh, we're certainly open to uh, thoughts and ideas about changes if needed. Well, because what my concerns are on the percentage uh -huh. is that when you look at uh, the notification boundary, if you will, mm -hmm. with the adjoining properties, that really limits that notification area considerably. Mm -hmm. uh, so if you have somebody that's 200 foot away or whatever, they're not going to get notified because they're not in that very tight notification boundary. And, but yet you're still looking at 50%. So I think that's gonna happen if you're gonna keep that tight 
of a notification area, I think that percentage should come down. Just, okay. That's just my thoughts. Okay. Yeah, thank you for sharing. Um, and I think that that's a good segue into what's on the slide, which is that there would be a 14-day protest period, uh, very similar to what we do for other zoning cases, um, that, uh, again, if it's more than 50% of the owners of adjacent and contiguous properties that protest, then it would become a conditional use. Next slide. And we've got some maps that will show this. So uh, this is a map, uh, just some scenarios to illustrate how this works. There was a memo that was included as part of the packet for the MAPC meeting a couple weeks ago um, that provided additional detail and is available online. So in this instance, the orange house uh, applies for a short-term rental administrative permit. The blue properties, out, the properties outlined in blue, are abutting and contiguous to it. So you can see that there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven properties that are uh, adjacent, abutting and contiguous. So you would have to have four own, more than three owners. You'd have to have four owners that would file a protest in order to exceed the 50% threshold. Now, when we talk about owners, there's additional details uh, in the next slide. So next slide. So uh, we're counting ownership the same way that we do for other planning protests. So it's very common to have two people listed on the title of a property. So in this instance, in order to be counted as towards the owner percentage, it would have to have signatures from all of the owners. So if there are two people listed on the deed, you would have to have both people sign. That would count as one owner, not two, one owner. So that that way, if you have a property that is owned by a group of people, it doesn't, you know, it does not weigh the numbers in their favor. It's one owner per pro uh, based on the ownership. Next slide, please. Excuse me, Scott. Got a quick question. Yeah. Me. So if you have two owners on the property, uh -huh. one of them fails to sign then that protest would be null and void, correct? It is not a valid protest at that point. Thank you. Yep. And that is consistent with how protests are handled for other zoning cases. And in notification, right now you notify the HOAs or the neighbor associations. Are you mm -hmm. going to continue doing that? Uh, so no, on this? We will for other cases, but not for this one. This one is just to the property owners that are abutting and contiguous. OK. Mm -hmm. At least that's how it's proposed. Um, there is a, you know, there are some different scenarios that can happen with this. And so uh, as staff, we kind of got together and, and thought about some different ones that might apply. So this one, in this instance, uh, there's an orange property where we're saying, okay, what if hypothetically they applied for an administrative permit for short-term rental? Uh, all of the properties outlined in blue are abutting and contiguous to the one in orange. In this instance, though, there are three properties, the parking lot to the kind of northwest, the building to the southwest, and the building to immediately to the south. Those are all owned by the same church. So in this instance, the church counts as one property owner despite having three properties and despite having the majority of the property in this area. So they count as one owner towards that ownership total towards the 50 percent. Yeah. And, and we go through this scenario because it, in this way, by counting owners and a percentage of owners, it is different than how protests are done at the, per the state statutes at a percentage of land area. Commissioner Stay McKay. Staying with that scenario, if, if I own three houses, that's three votes or one vote? Counts as one vote. Okay, next slide. Uh, for the, uh, how we're going to operationalize this. Scott, because, Scott, I'm sorry, sorry. Yes, sir. So in this particular case, if he owns three houses, it counts as one vote. Does that, do, are there three properties or just one property? It counts as one because we're doing it based on the owners, total number of okay. owners. All right. Yeah. Three abutting properties owned by the same person. That's one owner. That brought it up. Yep. also includes the property that's in question right it does not so just like the current 
um, protest, we do not include the applicant property. Okay. Yep. The subject site. And I'm seeing that Jeff and Jay are having a conversation. So, okay. At any time, jump in if I, <laughs> okay. Keep, oh, thanks. Keeping Jeff in line. All right. Um, in terms of how this gets operationalized, um, because, again, there are 500 to 600 of these in Wichita currently, uh, we are proposing that the uh, short-term rental property owners would have 12 months to come into compliance with this uh, portion of the zoning code. Uh, we are also proposing that we would hire uh, temporary and part-time consultant assistants to help process the administrative permits because uh, zoning runs with the land and these would be uh, one-time approvals for a property because they, they don't run with the ownership. Uh, we anticipate that this would be a one-time surge in cases, and if we can get through that, then we can return back to a rate that is more sustainable for staff to handle. The other thing, a quick note that came up during advanced plans this morning was that if uh, they have 12 months to come into compliance, that would allow a short-term rental that can prove that they were in operations prior to the time that the zoning code change takes effect, they could continue operating for the 12 months. However, if you wanted to start a new short-term rental that had not previously been operating, you would need to receive the administrative permit in order to start up that new short-term rental. Next slide, please. So um, also, uh, so if, let's say hypothetically, there's a scenario where we run into a situation where uh, more of these are controversial and end up uh, that there's a great number of them that go to a conditional use. Well, we have a number of things that we can do to help address that, a situation like that because we're very cognizant of the idea that we have 24 meetings with you, the MAPC, every year. So, and we know that your agendas are very robust right now, so what do we do if we end up with a lot of conditional uses? Well, one option is that we can, we can set a limit, we can meter the amount of short-term rental conditional use cases that would get onto the agenda uh, at every meeting. We, we know that that would push out how long it would take to get the cases heard, but it, isn't, it is an option that we can do. Uh, another option would be to consider holding a request of you to hold special MAPC meetings to consider uh, conditional uses for short-term rentals. And then the third would be to uh, issue a moratorium if we simply get to the point where we just were not able to process them. Uh, I don't put that up there because I, I, think it's a, I don't think that it's a likely scenario, but I do want to let you know that we do have that option. So. And that would be at the city level that that would need to be need to occur. Okay, next slide. Okay, so that is the portion about the zoning code. Uh, the policy uh, is fairly simple. This would uh, simply exempt the administrative permits for short-term rentals in the city uh, from having to comply with the sign posting requirement. So, and with that, I'll stand for any questions on this Oh, wait, no, no, no. Sorry, I do want to take you through uh, this document, the one, uh, one to two pager that was handed out. In terms of the changes, and I'm just going to speak to the zoning code and the poli MAPC policy. So the zoning code was updated to include all of the definitions and terms. That was the one change that was made. And to the policy number 20, there were no changes made to that. The rest of the changes were to the licensing uh, proposal, and we'll talk about that more as the next item. Okay, any questions on the presentation to this point? Commissioner McKay. No, no questions. Uh, Scott, comment on how homeowners associations handle this. Sure. So homeowners association provide a another level of regulation, or they can, um, and that is really a private uh, uh, contract between private parties. So uh, they can choose to prohibit short-term rentals if they want to. These proposed changes to the zoning code would not impact uh, HOA uh, covenants, so it doesn't undo anything that's been done 
to date, and it does not prohibit or restrict HOAs from having uh, those types of provisions in their covenants in the future. Commissioner Aldrich. Yeah, Scott, is there any thoughts about, uh, right now we have, what, 500 to 600 mm -hmm. uh, Airbnbs in operation right now. Is there any thought of a cap uh, that how many is going to be allowed, whether it's going to be 1,000, 2,000, mm -hmm. you know, five? Uh, there, there are some communities that do it that way. Um, we, in the feedback that we've received, uh, we have not, we've not heard that that's a direction that people wish to pursue um, as of yet. It doesn't mean that it couldn't be done, but um, we, we've not heard feedback that led us in, to, to move in that direction. Shouldn't that be something that's thought about now since we're in the early stages of looking at doing something? It, uh, because if you have, uh, Let's say an area that you got a five or six block area, mm -hmm. and all of a sudden every single one of them wants to do an Airbnb. Uh, they well, would be allowed to do that. I think there's two things that I would point out to that. Um, number one is that as the MAPC, uh, we look to you to help inform, tell us, indicate to us about what's a good fit for, for our community and what isn't. So uh, we're looking to you for the guidance. So I'm excited to see what your guidance is. The second part is that um, we initially did hear comments that there were concerns about clustering of short-term rentals and the effects that having a lot of them in one small area would have. Uh, we, uh, we've done this a couple of different ways. And I guess before I get there, my, the first version that we had would have allowed them by right throughout the city uh, without the need for a uh, zoning process. Uh, we took that out for public comment. We received comments that um, people were concerned because they wanted to be able to have feedback on whether or not a short-term rental next door to them was a, an appropriate use. And so because of that, uh, we, drafted, we drafted up the zoning process, largely very similar to what you see today. Uh, but with that, we included a 600-foot buffer distance between short-term rentals. Uh, that provision was taken out to the district advisory boards and the feedback that we heard. We heard some comments in support but the uh, majority of the comments that we heard were not in favor of that. Also, at the city council level, um, we heard questions about whether or not that was a good fit for Wichita. And so um, that is how we have arrived at the proposal, uh, was through that process of iterative process of here's an idea, here's an idea, and getting feedback on it. OK. That ends questioning on this part. I believe we need to hear the second part in order to make a decision on the first part. Um, well, yes or not? You, not entirely. Uh, what I would suggest is that the first part, so the first staff report, the first item is on zoning and the policy. Let me see. You have the authority to, you really, uh, in order for changes to be made, you have to approve it. Otherwise, it, it doesn't go anywhere. Um, what I would, uh, what I would highlight to you, and I think what you've stressed uh, during their comments are, these are very connected. Um, now, the next one that you'll hear about, it is just advisory. You're only providing a recommendation. But if you approve the zoning um, and, and you don't, well, I guess since you're advisory on the other one, it's a little less complex because the city council can elect to hear it whether or not they want to. But the first one could have impacts on how the city moves forward. So if you don't approve the zoning one, it, it, it really changes kind of the menu of options. Okay, Commissioner Foster. Ty Bin, can I ask you to put up the slide with the four recommended actions? And Scott, is that, is, are we at the point where making a motion to take those four actions is appropriate or is there more you wanna say before we do that? Well, um, we obviously public comment, public comment. And, and questions and discussion, but uh, the staff recommendation at this point is for these that you make these four actions um, today if you're comfortable doing that. All right, thank you. Okay, so I think we would then call for public comment because you're basically the applicant, right? I mean, yeah, I mean, okay. that's one, yeah. Okay, um, so do we have members of public in chambers who would like to make comments on the zoning and MAPC policy changes? 
Yes, please step forward to the podium, and you have three minutes, and thanks for your participation. And this will be on zoning and the yep. notification. Um, Jack Patton, address 337 South Rutan, Wichita, Kansas 67218. Um, as to the changing of the zone, I'm sure there's legal issues on that, but that seems to be... Uh, kind of uncomfortable because it's hard to change the zoning back if there are screw ups. And that's part of the big problem here is you got people in the neighborhood that uh, really shouldn't be there. How do you get rid of them? And since the zoning stays with the property and not the, not the applicant, um, that just increases problems for um, the neighbors and the neighborhood. Uh, I'm sure everybody's familiar with the big incident that started all this, so I won't go into that. Um, the other issue I have is uh, with the sign or the lack of signs. I spoke earlier about it was being um, hidden. I guess I need to change my verbiage on that. Um, I'll go with restricting, concealing, or uh, failing to notify or keeping secret. Um, if you're restricting or concealing the notification of the neighborhood and the residents in the area as to what's going on, the question it becomes why and who are you concealing it for? Wanting this, who's wanting this concealed? And why is it a special exemption for Airbnb? Um, I can go on websites, uh, the internet, find houses for sale that are empty, fully furnished, uh, rent for rent, and uh, any Airbnb that's already on the website. So the excuse of fear of people of breaking in is offset by the desire of those who are going to profit from this, the Airbnb and the realtors, is uh, kind of offset by wanting to keep uh, any persons who are concerned about this keeping all the information under the radar, so to speak. Um, based on past experiences in uh, inspection, military, and personal life, if you think you have to be secretive uh, about your business, maybe you shouldn't be doing that business. Okay, thank you. Any questions for the speaker? Thank you. Uh, other speakers in the room who would like to speak on this topic? Thank you. My name is Jason Krause. I'm at 243 North Pinecrest here in Wichita, Kansas. A um, couple of things that I would like to, uh, to propose that you consider as you consider this. One, I would very much like to see us keep the seven-day limit in place during the intervening period from whenever this the legislation as it's passed is passed until licensure and approval is required. I would like to see that rather than have us with a year of Wild West, unlicensed, uh, you know, re renting, coming and going, possible more party houses popping up. Um, I'd also like to have any past violations of our current laws on the books or general party house and nuisance items to count against those that are trying to apply for these processes. Um, we have, in my neighborhood, I have one property owner that I believe to be negligent. She's had the police call three times on properties uh, that are short-term rental properties, and she's not in compliance with the law as she generally operates right now. Um, the signage has been spoken about, I think at a minimum, for any new properties that are not currently operating that might be grandfathered in, or that might, might not be grandfathered in, pardon me, um, they're not listed on Airbnb yet because that would be against the law in this. I think they should be subject to signage. Anything grandfathered as it goes through that, maybe that might be accepted, but new properties going forward, signage should be a requirement. We need to notify the neighborhoods. Um, and also a couple of other things. In the current regulations as it's at, Three, kind of it's a three strikes and you're out situation on licensure. Um, three strikes is probably too many. I think two major events that are causes of misdemeanor 
faults uh, ought to be enough for you to be stripped of your licensure to operate that property safely in the neighborhood. That's two very egregious violations in a year. Um, I think asking for more than that is uh, inviting negligence. Um, I also would like to see us move that approval threshold down to 30% to avoid situations where we have kind of odd numbers, you know, that hits us where a 40% approval, you know, or a 40%, you know, uh, you know, doesn't, you know, uh, uh, you know or, or basically it allows for people that are good neighbors to get approval of their neighbors and those that have issues where people next door to bring them to you to discuss what those issues are for, as we work towards approval. And uh, I'd love to see a 21 day admin uh, permit approval protest window, but I understand that that might be already locked into the books. We may not be able to move that. But uh, again, uh, any questions you have for me, I'd like to answer. Okay, questions for the speaker. Can, can you identify or can you define uh, egregious? Um, egregious events that we've had in my neighborhood have been eggings, uh, eggs thrown over back fences from one Airbnb property into another. I've also had uh, air, uh, airsoft and BB guns being discharged towards my house from an Airbnb house behind me. We've had, of course, the shooting, the event that started this whole process on April 11th, 2021, where uh, Elijah was killed uh, out my back window, basically. Um, those are three major ones that we've had police called. We've had other events where people are driving aggressively through the neighborhood, screeching tires at many, many hours of the day and night, uh, driving wrong way up uh, one-way streets, in part because they're not familiar with the neighborhood, but then doing it at some speed. Uh, that's not something that invites a lot of neighborly tension. So you're basically just saying that when police are called out, is that what you... Because I, I'm, I would like to see police being called as, as something that is a very, very uh, negative impactor to someone's operate, to ability to operate one of these properties in an otherwise residential neighborhood. These are commercial interests. If we had police called at a commercial interest three and four times a year, we might be a little concerned about the operation of that business. Okay, thank you. Any other questions for the speaker, Commissioner Blick? When you were talking about signage, are you just talking about the signage temporarily or a permanent signage so then there's notification or safety that people will know that when they're showing up at night, because most of these people are not from this area that are coming in, a signage out in front of the house that lets them know that, hey, this is a house, that if they're trying to knock on some door or trying to get into a house, that... or are you I, talking just temporary? I believe more the, the temporary development application signage should be required for, absolutely required for people applying that are not operating currently. I believe that. I, I don't want to dictate signage for an operating and approved Airbnb um, just because that is really on the onus of the operator, the owner, to get the proper instructions to their guests so that they can safely get to the property. Now, that being said, somebody who's trying to break into the wrong house because that owner didn't operate and didn't communicate that information properly, that's something else to consider as an egregious violation that I would consider a safety violation to our neighborhoods. Again, commercial traffic in a residential neighborhood. Okay. Any other questions for the speaker? Thank you for your participation. Any other speakers on this topic? Please come forward. Hi. Um, my name is Emily Alvarez. I live at 2456 West St. Louis Street here in Wichita, Kansas, 67213. Um, I wanted to speak on this topic. I wasn't... Um, prepared for this necessarily, but I'll do my best. Um, first of all, I want to say I'm sorry that other people are having negative impacts of negligent Airbnb owners. Um, I am not one of those, so I'd just, just like to speak on that. Um, I take pride in the homes that I run. Um, I take I, safety is my number one priority of my guests. I have ring cameras out front. We have lights on whenever it's dark, the minute I have it automated, so the minute the sun goes down, my lights come on. That safety is number one for me. I communicate with my neighbors. They know that we're Airbnb's. bees. They have my phone number to make sure they can reach out to me if there's any issues. Um, I've been a super host and we've been in operation um, long enough to, to secure that title with Airbnb. Um, and with, with that, that is approved by our guests. 
Um, they have a rating system. If my house was not taken care of, if it wasn't a rep good representation of the neighborhood, I would hear about it and then people wouldn't rent my property. So that's something that I definitely take um, into consideration. Um, the other thing about our Airbnbs that I personally, I'm a newer resident of Wichita. I'm married to a born and bred Wichita, but you know, I've come around to being a Wichita myself. Um, it's important for me to not only make the city better, but to make our neighborhood better. And that's something that, um, again, we take immense pride on, but it's also the fact that um, when my family came in from out of town for our wedding here in Wichita, downtown Wichita, this is where my family stayed. A lot of our guests are friends and family. They're coming for weddings and funerals. We allow uh, with our properties, it's an affordable option for people to come with their kids, with their families. They have, you know, they have small gatherings, but we do not allow parties. We say that in our thing. So I know some people are negligent, but that's not the case for us. Um, in addition to that, sometimes we do rent out for multiple months at a time, and we've had long -term, longer-term guests, three to six months, um, for people that are working in construction. And even right now, we have um, a nurse that is here with her family, her two kids, her two dogs, her husband all moved to town. So for me, um, I know I don't have much time, but that's something for in terms of signage. I would not want signage in my yard because it's a safety issue for the people that are moving in. We have family with young kids um, there, so that would be my concern and um, about the signage. I understand that people want to know where Airbnbs are. To me, that's a personal communication thing, and that's something that we do. So I just wanted to represent that as well. Um, and can I... In you have 11 seconds for nope. any additional <laughs> no, go for it. comment you have. Yeah. Um, the signage we're talking about is to notify the people living around the property in question that an application for zoning change has been filed. Okay. So that wouldn't be a permanent sign to say, this is an Airbnb, but rather there's a zoning application for this property that's temporary prior to a hearing like this so that folks know something's changing and can look into what that change is. And then once that permit is... Once the permit, what the zoning change would occur Perfect. or the administrative permit was issued, then there would be no signage identifying. So are, would you be opposed to the signage to let people know a zoning change was happening at your property? Do you see any concern about that? I would be interested to see how that works for like our property right now. I mean we have someone in there through July. She's a, you know, she's a travel nurse. She's here in town. Yeah. Would I be required to put a sign out? That there was going to be a zoning change because, on that property. Yes. Yeah, but that would just be my no, concern. Oh, no, grand. But there'd be a grandfathering for the first year. So your timing of the administrative permit could be made such that it wasn't occupied at the time, potentially. Perfect. Any other questions? Okay. Any other questions for the speaker? Okay. Comm Commissioner Aldrich. Ma'am, even though that you're going to be grandfathered if this passes for a year, mm -hmm. if you were a new applicant, for example, would you have any uh, uh, restrictions or any concerns or uh, about notifying your other neighbors uh, about what you're looking at doing, or would you just rather not notify them? For me, um, I don't plan on keeping secrets. That's not the kind of business I want to run. And to me, this is a business. This is something that, um, you know, I'm, this is how I'm making my living here in Wichita is by, you know, providing hospitality. And that's the way I say it. You're going to come to my city. I'm going to give you a list of recommendations and all my favorite restaurants. So to me, it's not, it's not a secret. I'm not trying to hide anything. Um, I think I don't have any major concerns. Like if we decide to open another Airbnb and this passes, I would go, I'm assuming I would go through that same process as someone new for the next property, right? So um, I don't have any concerns about notifying people, um, but it's also a mat, like I think we talked about that a little bit earlier. A lot of the neighbors and the neighborhoods I pick, cause you know, when, when I go to buy a house, I don't want to be an HOA. There's other restrictions. And I, we understand that people that are purchasing houses in HOAs have different expectations. So that's not a property I would purchase first and foremost, but the properties that would be grandfathered in, most of our neighbors are rentals, like long-term renters and often decades long renters. Um, and the condition of those homes, to be perfectly frank, are making my Airbnb look bad. Those are the houses that aren't being taken care of. Those are the, you know, when you say you're going to be mailing that letter out of state, yeah, that property has not, be, not been seen by the owner in probably a long time because they are in bad condition. 
those are the houses that are not being taken care of. Those are the people that are not, in my view, representing the neighborhood well. Um, and of course, that's just my case. I don't represent all 500 Airbnbs in town. But for us, yeah, you can notify them, but it's not going to be the people living there. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Other questions? Okay. Any others? Uh, Commissioner Warren. I'm going to make a comment here because it keeps coming up and I just keep biting my tongue. Uh, I'm, I'm opposed to putting up the signage on, on, on this because not, not only are you inviting the neighbors, you're inviting the world. I mean, people from all over are going to see that. Do we really want to, to hear a testimony from people that live in other neighborhoods, you know, a, a block, 10 blocks, half a mile away to come in and talk about, about that? So if we're, if we're notifying the people that are directly around the, around the property and we establish that zone, those are the ones that I want to hear from. And beyond that, I don't want to, I don't think it's anybody else's business what I'm doing with that. Okay, thank you. All right, other speakers on this topic in chambers. Please go to the podium and you know what to do. Uh, on another case, is there a prohibition from speaking on two cases? Okay, three minutes, Lonnie. Okay, so your name and address. Lonnie Barnes at twenty nine twenty four North Terrace Drive, Wichita, Kansas. Uh, so I've been listening to this here, and I'm you know I'm kind of torn both ways on this in here. Uh, I think there should be something that associates Airbnbs with the surroundings in which the people are coming for. It's a reason that people come and stay at the hotels and the locations. And most times it's in, in relationship to the event or wherever they're trying to attend. And so I think there should be some, some kind of correlation that shows in where we put the Airbnbs and where they are. Uh, I, I understand the part about homeowners association being able to put more teeth into it. But I think something should be given to the neighborhood associations as well. You know, what I see in here, a, a lot of neighborhood associations that have changed from homeowners that used to be, 90% homeowners are now 90% rental property in here. Uh, you've changed the dynamics and in, in in, in just the price value of the homes in here. So that needs some consideration. So I think notification needs to be given to the neighborhood associations to let them know what's coming at them and how much of it's coming at them and where these things are at in here. Uh, so I get a little torn about that. But I do realize that there need to be op other options for property that's around events, things of this nature that they should be able to, to be able to do something with their properties. Thank you. Any questions for the speaker? OK. Anyone else in chambers who would like to speak on this item? Go ahead, please, sir. Hi, my name is uh, Brian Alvarez. I live at 2456 West St. Louis Street. Uh, that's Meridian and Central areas, just so you get an idea. Um, so I, I, me and my dad own Airbnbs. We've owned them short-term rentals since 2017. I'm born and raised in Wichita. We have one in Orlando, Florida, Claremont, to be exact, and West Palm Beach, and also recently in Denver, Colorado. Um, I'm coming. <laughs> Emily's my wife, so she said a lot of what I was going to say. But um, basically what I was saying is we, we go off of reviews. Everything's reviews. So you stay at Airbnb, and if your place sucks, the people will tell you it sucks. If it's a bad neighborhood, it'll tell you it's a bad neighborhood. It brings your score down. Airbnb will get to the point where it suspends you or even terminates you if you're below like a 3.5. So a five stars A, four is is okay, but four for us is, is, is bad in sense you want a five. Um, we have six in town. We have 4.91, 4.88, 4.92, and 4.93. Living in that area, Delano and Sunflower District, of uh, we've actually brought up the area. We've cleaned it up. Trees, like she said, our land, the long-term tenants next door and around that area don't take care of their places. I feel like we've brought value to the places um, and, and made it better, to be honest. More lights um, in the neighborhoods, and it's a little safer, too. We have the privilege of talking to our neighbors because we like to be open about it. I know not everyone is, um, and I'm all for putting a license. In West Palm Beach, they have a license that they do online, and then if you have complaints, you can you can look up databases who has Airbnbs or short-term rentals. You can look that up online, and if you want to complain on a property, you can. So that's something done online. So I think that's that'd be something to think about. Uh, zoning, I think we're really strict on the zoning here. Just to give you a heads up, it's going really like 
detailed. Other places just say, hey, this is, in, in Orlando, it's Lake County, we have one set of rules. They have like a tax that they've agreed with the Airbnb, we're gonna charge an extra 3.4%. Um, and West Palm Beach, they have um, two, it's 225 a year. I think the same is here that you're proposing. Um, and also they have an inspector comes out. Well, at least one time they can come up to two times a year. So I think that's something that we should think about. I know I saw it on the notes, but um, I think that's great. I just think the zoning and like Emily said about the people saying, if my neighbor's gonna decide that doesn't take care of the property that has their grass three foot high and is gonna decide on my Airbnb when I cut the grass and, and spend a lot of money on it, I don't really agree with that or the owners that don't care about these places. Um, that's something to think about as well. Um, and like I said, I'm, I'm from Wichita. I love Wichita. I promote Wichita. Um, and um, I really hope that you guys come with something that's like on par, not too detailed, but not. And I do, I really do think that we should have licenses 100%. So stuff that the Crown Heights does not happen again, but it's going to happen regardless whether you're at a hotel or Airbnb or any other place that you're renting from. So, so yeah. Okay, thank you. Any questions, Commissioner Blick? A question. So yeah. at these other locations that um, you have, do they have signage or sticker on the door so a law enforcement knows or anybody like that or anything? No, so in Orlando, Claremont specifically, Lake County, what they do is you, you get the license and you have to place it inside the door, kind of like a hotel or like hotel rooms have it, but it has my name on it, the owner's name, and then it has their name and when you last did your license and then it'll have a number to report anything, you can put it to that county number or whatever, but you have to replace it obviously every year. So there's nothing outside, but it's inside the door. It has to be inside the door. Yeah. Okay. Okay, thanks. Any other questions? Okay. Uh, anybody participating virtually who would like to speak on this item? Okay, we'll bring it back to yes. the commission. Yes. Yes. Sorry, I, I do. Okay. Heilman. Sorry, I had my hand raised. I didn't. Oh, I'm put. sorry. Now we see you now. Could you please give your name and address, please? And then you have three minutes. Yeah, uh, my name is Trish Heilman. I'm at 139 South Fountain, 67218. Um, I was here for the advanced planning meeting, and so have had a little bit of time to like think through um, the the process and the stuff, and also actually talk to some other community members in the meantime. Um, and as I've been doing that, I um, have just sort of consolidated some ideas thinking that having, having the process really be not so much zoning, but having it be really focused on licensing is really, really important. And I'm gonna, so for why? Because licensing, if you have a problem property, if you have a problem owner, then the lice, the neighbors can have input yearly into whether that is stopped or allowed to continue. If zoning gets changed, that is in perpetuity. And so, you know, that again can change the nature of a neighborhood if the majority of the properties are zoned for business versus just residential. I think you could see long-term issues. Also, we don't know, this is all new stuff, this whole v Airbnb. And so we don't know what 10 years down the road is gonna look like. And so having zoning change and again, be permanent, I think decreases flexibility for our city. And if we have a yearly licensing process, we can be more flexible with how things are gonna have to zig and zag and change. Um, that would require from what the conversations that I had at the advanced planning meeting um, after the meeting, um, a board that would be established to take the licensing protest submissions or whatever. So if in the licensing process, if the neighbors protest, then there would need to be a board established that would hear those protests. But that could be, that would need to be a board, not the MAPC, which I think you guys are pretty busy if I'm if I'm understanding things correctly. And so having that not on your plate seems like real wisdom. Plus, it could be a separate group that has more representation from all, you know, from Airbnb owners, from neighborhoods, from this kind of stuff. This having that kind of process, I think, could be really, um, really important. And um yeah, and, and pretty pretty darn doable. I think most of the things that are in the zoning changes can be just switched right into the licensing procedures because most of the stuff that, that staff has thought of are really thoughtful and really important and the party um, zoning thing, you know, the, the party stuff. Um, 
sorry for not the right words, but that stuff is really important to get implemented. Um, and having a process is really important so that people can operate their businesses legally um, is really important. Um, so thank you so much for your time. Any questions for the speaker? Thank you. Any other persons participating virtually who would like to speak on this topic? All right, that concludes our public comment on this segment. This being the segment MAPC has authority to make a decision on. Commissioner Blick. Uh, I got a question for staff. Um, would being this would be an administrative permit or adjustment, would it be a layer that's on GIS mapping that would actually identify that property as? Uh, the answer should be yes. It's going to be a zoning case, an administrative permit. So, I mean, if you open up GIS, you should be able to see it if the case tracking is on. Whether it's a separate layer identifying just STRs, I'm not certain that that's going to be the case. Okay. But it will be just like any other zoning case. But you could definitely GIS. find it that way. If you wanted to know that, hey, was this an Airbnb in your neighborhood, then that'd be a way to find it, too. Hey. You would go to the zoning map, find that property that you're interested in, and it would have a case. You'd have to follow that case link to see what the case is. Because it could be any number of other cases, but, but yes. Okay, definitely. Thank you. And again, if a zoning change were made, the person wanting to run the Airbnb would have to, or whatever short-term rental, would have to apply for a license within the 12-month period, licensure being a separate issue. But once the property is zoned, anyone who purchased that property subsequently could operate it with no further action they would still have to apply for a license, but that doesn't require notification or public oversight or input. Okay. Correct. Okay. Um, Commissioner Stop. McKay. You're saying that without zoning, this issue can't go forward. Is that correct? Uh, no, not necessarily. Okay. Um, with without the zoning so um, if, if you say hey this is the wrong approach we need to do something different or you say we don't even want to change the zoning the the challenge that we would run into is that the zoning code currently prohibits short-term rentals unless you're going to make it be a stay of seven days or more so we've still got a challenge with the zoning and how uh, how a lot of these are being operated in the community so that that would be the issue that would be Confronting us. So, you, based on what you're saying, then seven days is the key. If you say, I'm going to say three and a half days or something to that mm -hmm. effect, uh, and then amend the zoning code based upon that, and you could do it by right? Uh, we looked at that approach early on in the process, and the feedback that we got is that uh, neighbors wanted to be able to have input on whether or not a short term rental was an appropriate use. Uh, nearby them. So uh, that's why we have structured the zoning process the way that we have. Um, and so that's how we've arrived here. And the licensure is not location specific. So if, it, if we relied on licensure to govern this matter, then the licensure could be used at any property, again, without notification. Can you help me understand sure, that part? Sure, Yeah, we haven't covered the licensing yet, but the, that's the, in the next item. But the licensing is on, it's per the unit, per the dwelling unit. So if a dwelling unit is being used as a short-term rental, it is a license for that particular unit. So a duplex, for instance, could have two, there could be two licenses for that duplex, one for each dwelling unit. And, but the problem, the licensure process currently would have no oversight process or opportunity for public input. That is- Until the license is granted and then complaints. That, that is uh, correct in that there's no mechanism for notification or receiving of public comments as part of the licensing process as currently drafted. Scott, I have a question. Yes, sir. Joe, why are there three to 500 of these still being operated? Have we not done anything as a city? 
There have, <laughs> yes, no, there have been enforcement actions taken um, where we have received complaints. So again, our enforcement is done on a complaint basis. And we, last year, I believe we were somewhere in the range of 25, somewhere between 20 to 30 complaints. Um, of those, uh, what we do is we serve them notice. Uh, they have an opportunity to take corrective action. Uh, many of them did. They, they advertised just for seven days. Uh, some of them did not. And at that point, we can't force them uh, to come into compliance. What we do is we take them to court. Now, since this process has been going on, uh, we have uh, halted uh, those court proceedings uh, or proceeding with taking them to court uh, to see how this gets resolved in terms of the, the regulation process. Thank you. Commissioner Aldrich. <clears throat> what would prevent an operator, an owner of the Airbnb advertising for seven or eight or nine days mm -hmm. and then, but actually they're only renting it out for three or four days you know um i think that that would come down to the platform logistics in terms of uh if you're advertising it for seven days i don't believe that the system will allow you then to uh it depends on how you do it but i think you set it up so that it only allows you to book it for seven day stays now that is not to say that there aren't Airbnb operators who are operating today without that seven day restriction. There are, you can look up online, there are a number of them. I know, but what I'm saying, let's say they advertise it for seven days, they book it for seven days or eight days or nine days and their tenants after three or four days, they, oh. ah, we're done, we bail out. Cer certainly, and that could that could certainly happen. So if that's the case, why do we need to even go through this whole process? Well, I think that we're receiving feedback that um, from owners and operators, especially of short-term rentals, to say that the current regulations don't fit with uh, either the, the way that they're operating or also with market demand. I'd like Most to make of them are operating illegally right now, and I think some action needs to be taken to correct that. The, the regulations we have are obsolete, and they're, they don't fit current conditions, current market, um, or current reality. And they need to be updated, and I think this is a very good process for updating them. Is there more discussion, or can I make a motion? Are we ready yet? Make a motion. <laughs> All right. I, I would. Joe's ready. <laughs> I would like to move that we, that MAPC takes the recommended four steps from staff to initiate and approve a zoning code amendment to recommend that the governing body is adopt the amendments and that we amend the MACPC policy 20. I would second that if I could add discussion to that. I would prefer to see some additional notification to the HOAs and the neighbor associations. Right now, they already send notification out for every one of these cases to the neighbor associations and the HOAs. They're the ones who are actually dealing with this problem. And then they usually go and give them to code enforcement when they get so many of these phone calls because most people don't know the process of going through code enforcement. They don't get a vote, but they at least get some type of notification that these are in their area. So was that a substitute motion or? No, I just asked to see if you would add, add that to your motion of adding HOA and neighborhood to be notified. I don't know that I'm personally inclined to um, because that <sighs> truly complicates the process a great deal, adds a whole lot more people to the mix of, of people who are not going to be part of the protest percentage but are liable to show up at a meeting and, and, I and have something to say about it even though it's 10 blocks away from them. Well, and I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't change my second because I don't want to give more authority to homeowners associations than what they've got already. Well, I mean, they're right now, as is, they notify every, uh, they're notified one person, whoever is on record as I, like I'm president of a neighbor association, I get every notification that's in this whole Southwest part of Wichita. It's just one person that gets that notification. 
as a neighbor association, they send it out to them right now for every single case that's in that area. I think that they're the ones who are usually dealing with these situations. They should at least be notified. They don't get a vote, but they can still be notified, just like how it is now. They still get notified, but without no votes. I'm not willing to change my motion, so I think if you want to include that in what we're voting on, you will need to make a substitute motion and get a second, and we'll have to discuss it separately. Oh, sounds good. You had a comment, Commissioner McKay, is that lend to this topic specifically? Yes. Go, ahead. Go ahead. Well, I can sit here, and we've talked, to, I've had meetings with Scott. To me, there's enough in the air that we don't know what's going on. I agree that if we're, if we're behind times with what needs to be going on. I think a timeline for getting it done is fine. Licensure is one of the key, if probably not the key thing. That's why I keep asking about zoning. That we need to maybe have a committee within this group, work with staff and say, what can we do to make it go forward and not, you know, because homeowners associations are altogether different than neighborhood associations. Homeowners associations can make their own rules. Neighborhood associations can't. It's just a sounding board. So, you know, that's one of the clarifications that, that, that needs to be straightened out. Uh, you know, we, we, we listen to people today talk, testify about they work, they do, they, they, want, they want help from us. I don't know that, that, um, that we shouldn't, you know, Take a little bit of time. I know everybody said, well, we've been doing, working on this for two years. We've not been working on it for two years. Staff been working around it and about it for two years. But I don't, you know, I, 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 I'm having a tough time with something being, part of my expression, shoved down my throat that I don't think we all know what else. How many questions have been asked here today that we don't know and we're going to pass legislation, especially the zoning that's going to go on with the property for infinity? Commissioner Warren. The problem we got with that was that no matter what we come up with, we won't know what we've got in, until you until you enact it. We've got something that I think that we can we can modify as we as we learn as we go, but the, I think this this the search for perfect is is going to get in the way of the of the good, and I think we've got something that's good that can that can work and get us get us going down the road, and then and then we can make adjustments to it as we as we need because we won't find those things out until we actually do it. We don't, we don't know what we don't know yet, and we won't know until we until we figure something out and start it. My concern is that a zoning change feels really permanent to the location, and then if, a, if the operator changes at that location, then there's no op opportunity to police that particular operator. So to me, licensure makes the most sense yeah, before, I think we're uh, before a zoning change, licensure, the nuisance party act, the nuisance house act, which actually governs residences too, where this kind of thing can happen, to me makes a lot of sense. But we don't have jurisdiction over those two rules. So, Commissioner Duell, move this forward. I would like to second Commissioner Foster's motion. motion. Okay, and if Call somebody for, wants to make call it, the question. Yeah. Wait, wait, wait. I'd like to clarify okay. who seconded. Was it yeah. Chuck? Commissioner Foster made the motion to accept the or to approve the recommendations for zoning and MAPC policy change on notification. And we have a second from Commissioner Warren. And, and a double second from Mr. Duell. Um, so I'd like to make a substitute motion. Commissioner Joe Johnson would like to make a substitute motion. Can we defer this for some period of time that's reasonable to come up with the answers that, of the questions that were raised today? Can you, I missed the very first part of that, Joe. For some reasonable time, I don't know how, how long to defer it. Um, which, which questions do you want answered, Joe? That's an that's a well, open-ended deal that we've, we've, we can, we can do think, this all, all year long. I think staff has them written down. I just don't think we need to be passing something that we don't fully understand. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to second that motion. Okay, we have a commissioner, a, a motion from Commissioner Johnson. Uh, 
to defer a decision. We don't have a specified date for the deferral or any actions to be taken between now and the deferral. Well, could we? Let me back up a little bit. Following up on Commissioner McKay's statement about maybe a possible uh, board or a commission from this group of maybe four individuals or so, uh, would that be something that uh, this board would can consider before making this final vote and moving it forward? I think that's what advanced plans for. Okay. I mean, so the advance, the advance plans would then be the body to do further study with staff until a strong recommendation for approval could be brought to the full commission. And, and, just, my and just a quick staff clarification. Um, I appreciate the dialogue. I appreciate the, the challenge, you know, of, 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 of deliberating this. Uh, the one thing on this motion is I'm just curious, uh, what additional information or, or what specifics can can staff do? Um, and I want to I'd, I'd like to kind of know that answer because if I get the question about well what happened to MAPC, I'd like to be able to say, you know, uh, what specifically staff can do to to help move the discussion forward with, to a solution, either, whatever solution is preferred. Well, one of the questions uh, that was brought up. You know, it was a notification area. The other question that was brought up was a protest per, uh, percentage, whether it could, could go from 50%, uh, 40%, 30%. And then, so those comments were made, and then it just, it just dropped. You know, so, you know, again, those are some of the questions that I want answered. You know, uh, does it make sense uh, to lower the, uh, again, since we're so tight on the notification, Area, does it make sense to drop that percentage of notification down from 50% to 30%, for example? And do we also need to, to notify the occupant as well as the owner? We yes. don't for zoning cases. Scott? Well, we've had those questions when we, and we've answered them. Okay, what's, um, the, okay, what's the percentage there? Here, here, what's, the, what's the percentage? I haven't 50? had a chance to talk yet, so let me, let me just wait a little bit. I mean, we've been going around and around on this topic since 10 o'clock this morning. I mean, I'm, I'm frankly worn out. Staff has made a proposal. We've got to establish a baseline at some point in time. I mean, we can study the thing to death. We're, at that point in time, we'll, we'll just 50%, 30%, whatever it is, we're going to establish a baseline and we're going to react to that. Who says we can't change it after that? I mean, I want to tell you where I live. I live in a neighborhood that's 50 years old. We've lived there since we built the house. We don't have an HOA. We don't have a neighborhood association. I can tell you this. I'd rather have an Airbnb as neighbors to the north or south of me, either one of them. I take them today, and we can move out the people that own the house, okay? <laughs> I mean, you could, you could load up the van and ship them out. I mean, I don't want anybody to know that. But nonetheless, it'd be better I think they know now. <laughs> in my in my view, than, than what I have right now. So uh, that would be that would be my view. I, I think we ought to move forward, establish a baseline. Surely we can change the rules, regulations, what are we established today later on if we if we need to. But we gotta we gotta start somewhere. I'll take one more comment and then I want to call the question on the substitute motion. I'll call the okay. question for the okay. substitute okay. motion. Okay. All right. Thank you. We're thinking the same way there, Commissioner Warren. So we are calling the question on the substitute motion, which is to defer to a future date with a sub a sub study group, uh, which would be advanced plans. Um, so let we're laughing. Is that are we clear on what we're voting on? Okay, and so let's do a roll call okay. vote. Do we defer the action? Yes or no? Uh, uh, I'm going to say defer, no. Duel. No. McKay. Yes. Green. No. Bill Johnson is absent. Blick. Yes. Nix. No. Foster. No. Warren? No. Joe Johnson? Yes. Miles? No. Hartman? 
No. Aldrich. Yes. Williams Bay is absent. I have the vote as being five, four, seven against. Five, four deferral, seven against. So the m uh, double check my math. Let's see. I've got Mc no. I've got McKay, Blick, Foster. Foster voted no. That's where my math got off. Okay. Okay. So it's four to eight. Thank you, everyone. So the substitute motion failed. The original motion was to. Commissioner Foster with the second by a couple folks um, to accept, make the recommendation for approval per staff recommendation and comments. And to what the advanced plans. The, oh no, you, you no. Said yeah, advanced plans recommended that the full commission hear the case. You understand now why? It, okay. Yes. Right. That's why the advanced plans didn't recommend, because they wanted MAPC to fully participate. Um, and so now the motion to make the recommendation for approval, and we'll do that by roll call also. And so Fox gets to say first, and I vote no. I don't want to make the recommendation for approval as it stands, no. Duel? Yes. McKay? No. Green? Yes. Bill Johnson is absent? Blick? No. Nix? Yes. Foster? Yes. Warren? Yes. Joe Johnson? No. Miles? Yes. Hartman? Yes. Aldrich? No. Williams Bay is absent. Motion passes 7 5. That's what I have. Okay. We have Part B, which is recommendations relative to the municipal code and licensure. We do not have a the power to approve these recommendations, but we can make a recommendation to the city council related to these. Do we, so again, we have a presentation where Scott can quickly review what has changed since we last heard these things, which I think is the part that we're most interested as a commission since we can't approve it anyway. It, yes, and I would add that this is the one where the most uh, significant changes have occurred. And so. that was largely because of the Realtor Association information presented about their concerns, I believe. It, yes, there were some uh, there were some questions. We had some dialogue with them about their questions, and um, and we'll talk about the outcomes of, of how that changed uh, the proposed licensing. What I would like to do is ask Ty Ben to go to the licensing PowerPoint and please. Uh, Ty Ben, if you can uh, progress forward to the uh, where we start talking about what's in the licensing. That way we don't have to cover all the prior material. I'm going to grab a quick handout. Okay. So uh, for the staff presentation on licensing. So again, there are four components uh, that you're considering today with related to regulations of uh, short-term rentals. Uh, this is uh, licensing and also the nuisance party house uh, ordinance are the two components that are under consideration with this item. So for the license, uh, the an annual license would be required. Uh, the Proposed fee would be $225. That fee would cover the cost of administration, so uh, taking in the application, processing it. Also, it would cover the cost of hiring a part-time staff person for zoning enforcement to, uh, to uh, do that processing. 
Uh, it would also uh, cover the co- and also enforcement. It would also cover the cost of hiring or contracting with a company to uh, provide um, monitoring services of short-term rentals in the community and to monitor whether or not they're in compliance with the regulations. As part of the license, uh, short-term rentals w- uh, would be required to maintain uh, $250,000 of insurance. Uh, that all the marketing materials would need to include the license number to verify that they are um, in compliance uh, with the provisions there. Uh, They would also have to post a good neighbor policy. Uh, And this is based on uh, what communities like Albuquerque have done uh, for their regulations. Next slide, please. The maximum occupancy uh, would be two adults per bedroom plus two adults per unit. So that would allow you, if you've got a three bedroom house, you could have uh, two per bedroom, so six plus two, so you could have eight people. Adults, it does not regulate how many children uh, can be there. Um, And also it limits uh, gatherings to a maximum of 20 persons or less until uh, 10 p.m., at which point then the gathering needs to cease and only uh, the people who are staying there uh, should be on the property. Uh, It also requires that there be a uh, registered contact with the city that would be available to be contacted 24-7. Uh, so we've talked a little bit already today about ownership and what if someone in another state owns uh, the short-term rental. Well, uh, this would require, the licensing would require that there be a contact uh, that can respond 24-7 and that the, the responsible party, which is that contact, uh, would be uh, expected and required to be able to uh, appear at the premise within 30 minutes. So, and that is a change from what you saw last time is that uh, we've established that expectation that they're supposed to be able to to be to the property within a time time frame of 30 minutes. Next slide, please. Um, Licensing continued. Uh, So the city uh, would have the right to inspect short-term rentals upon complaint. So this is not an inspection that would take place um, prior to the license being granted, but rather it's on a complaint basis. Um, that there would be compliance with the codes uh, is a requirement. Again, uh, the distance separation uh, is not included. That was an early, early proposal uh, that was taken out before you saw it last a couple weeks ago. Uh, Also, uh, what's been removed is a proof of written notice to properties within 200 feet that was included. Uh, Last time, there were some comments about and questions about whether or not that was redundant. Uh, Also, uh, in the licensing, there's no mechanism for, formal mechanism for public input on whether or not a license should be granted. So uh, it was a courtesy notification, and because of the redundancy and the courtesy nature of it, uh, we, in the questions that came up, we have removed that from the current proposal. Next slide, please. Uh, The license uh, contains uh, the enforcement Um, It talks about the misdemeanor suspension, um, as was brought up during the public comments on the zoning piece. uh, There is a three strikes and you're out provision uh, for uh, revocation of licenses. And it's uh, three within a 12 month time period. Um, Revocation of license, uh, yes, three within any 12 and you would be ineligible to obtain a license for the next five years. Next slide. God, can I borrow you a second? Yes, sir. Is that complaints? Uh, no, that would have to be violations. Okay, that's clarification. Yep. Thing. I've got a question as well. Uh, what is the fine? Is the fine going to be five hundred dollars for people that you find out are operating without a license? Oh, it is, and the penalty, and I. It would be, it's too bad Sharon's not here. I'm going to try and look that up. I believe the answer is yes. It'd be a misdemeanor. So should be $500 and or six months in, in jail. We, we can, I'll verify that, but I believe that would be correct. Okay. Yeah, JR, if you can look through there. Any other questions on this information so far? Yes, Mr. Warren. Uh, the notification uh, at 24-7 and then showing up within 30 minutes. Where did that 30 minutes come from? I'm thinking if I own one of these and I got a call at 3 o'clock in the morning, 
I'm not sure I could get my pants on in 30 minutes. <laughs> yes, would sir. An hour, would um, an hour be? We can certainly change that to be an hour. Um, it, what it was is, uh, <laughs> it was. <laughs> Just pretend like you're going to Walmart. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, we are divulging. It, it, it was in response to uh, some of the comments that we heard from the prior version uh, at the MAPC meeting a couple of weeks ago uh, that uh, the, the issue was that, okay, it's great that you have a registered contact for these, but what are the expectations of what they're going to do to address the situation? And so um, making it so that they are ex uh, the clear expectation that they should appear at the property um, is how we attempted to address that. The 30 minutes, I believe, was included because it was felt that that was, uh, if there's a situation or an incident that's taking place, maybe there's loud music or people are throwing trash or something, We, uh, it was an attempt to get them in there in a timely fashion to be able to address those situations. And and then what's the penalty if they're not there within 30 minutes? Mm -hmm. Then. Hey, Scott, I'm here. What, what is, what is um, the enforcement? Fantastic. Sharon to the rescue. Thank you. Yeah. Um, the penalty for any violation, whether it's the 30 minutes or whether it's having too many people, um, it is a misdemeanor and it is a fine up to $500 um, and arguably jail time up to six months. Those are offenses that would go through municipal court. So it's not a civil penalty that Scott would just be, be rendering. It would have to go through court. And then I have a question. The platforms that govern Airbnbs and verbos, et cetera, could they be the one requesting a, uh, an inspection or would it have to be a local citizen? It's just based on a complaint. So it, it would somehow, it would have to be communicated to the city okay. so that staff would process that. Okay. And, and if I may, I'd point out, um, in addition to what Sharon said, every day the violation exists is a separate offense. Oh, so okay. Find, yeah, assuming they're found guilty, they'd be cumulative. And I would okay. I would point you to page twenty two in the packet for um, where that is. It's an item F. Okay. Thank you. Good discussion. Good questions. Anything else? Okay. Oh, uh, Commissioner Aldrich. Yeah, I just want to revert back a little bit to the fees, uh -huh. license fees, and also the insurance. Yep. Uh, Where'd you come up with those figures? They just seem a little light to me. Okay. Um, we were charged with uh, coming up with a fee that allowed for the short-term rental um, program to uh, fund itself. Uh, likewise, we were also charged with not, uh, oh, not creating something that generated more fees than were necessary. And so that's how we have arrived at the 225 is based on an estimate for how much it would cost to uh, hire a part-time person to process the applications and uh, do the enforcement as well as what it would cost for the um, for the equipment for them to do that job also what it would cost to do uh, to hire or contract with an organization to monitor and uh, 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 report violations to us of short-term rentals in the insurance i just think that you know Two hundred fifty thousand dollars is extremely light. If you know, I've had people that want to rent my part of my lot for uh, what they call those things, fireworks. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's that's a million dollar policy for three weeks. I believe that that is based on the amount and other uh, other requirements that the city has for other um, programs. But I'll defer to Sharon on that one. Let me get my unmute on here. Um, that was, it, it came from a number of other city, or not state, other ordinances in other cities. In that, that can be whatever amount um, staff determines it is. Um, I would agree a million dollars would be appropriate for a fireworks stand. Um, the city's for contract requirements is $500,000. And I think this was kind of a, 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 a medium amount that staff thought was appropriate. And uh, that amount is listed on page 12 of the packet. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Uh, with that, I'll keep rolling then. Uh, oh, okay, so we're at the end of the uh, license. I'll continue with the changes in just a moment, but uh, the party house nuisance ordinance 
Uh, this is one that the slide is uh, very brief on it, but I would refer to the information in your packet where the proposed uh, draft is in there. And what it does is it's a, it would pertain to gatherings of five or more people on a residential property. It does not need to be a short-term rental. It could be uh, just a, a house that someone owns, owner-occupied. It could be a long-term rental. It could be any kind of residential uh, setting, even apartments or, or condos. And where five or more people are gathered and any one of the uh, listed uh, nuisance activities are taking place, and that includes property damage, littering, um, outdoor, using the bathroom, um, threatening people or uh, property, et cetera, setting off fireworks, discharging firearms. Um, if any of those are taking place, then this provides police the ability to order people to disperse immediately. Um, so there's not a warrant. They just show up and they can order them to disperse. Is noise one of those nuisances, or is that a, under a sep the separate noise ordinance? Um, yes, noise is one of the nuisances. And that is Thank on you. page 29 and uh, 30 of the packet. Thank you. Oh, yes, uh, noise is number two. It's a violation of the city noise ordinance. Uh, of the chapter, relevant chapter of the city code. Okay, so not seeing any questions on that. Um, I'm gonna switch over to the handout, the two page, uh, one page double sided uh, handout where we talk about the changes that have occurred since the last meeting. And again, this is largely based on public input and comments that we received uh, from the last meeting. So the first bullet point is that we've updated it to clarify that the responsible party uh, is for the short-term rental, uh, should be available to come to the premises if required within 30 minutes to resolve any complaint. Uh, again, this is put in there to establish what the expectations of uh, responsibility are upon contact. Um, the next one then uh, is to clarify that it's unlawful for the owner, responsible party, or other person to violate the terms of the regulation. Uh, that was just inserted to add additional clarity uh, the next bullet point um, updated uh, that there would be a 30-day notice uh, if there's a violation uh, that they would have 30 days to bring it in in compliance. And that matches up with uh, the way that we currently operate uh, zoning uh, issues. So it's consistent with that. The next bullet point on the first bullet point on the following page, uh, we updated it to remove the requirement for notice to the adjacent property owners. Again, that notice we've talked about uh, for zoning still applies, but not for the license. Second bullet point is that uh, liability insurance can be obtained through a third party or booking platform. So if they acquire that through uh, Airbnb or another, another booking platform, uh, that that works for the liability insurance. The fourth bullet point is that uh, there's a requirement in the licensing for a diagram. Uh, that shows the rooms, uh, essentially what the layout is of the structure. That, that does not need to be done by an engineer. Um, in fact, there are diagrams of structures that we can get from the appraiser's office, which should satisfy that. Um, the individual can draw it up, but uh, we would really prefer to, we'd like to see that scaled so that we know what kind of dimensions we're dealing with. But an engineer does not need to sign off on it or do it. Um, the fourth one is we remove the requirement for a social security number on the uh, permit application or license application. Uh, we do require a birth date just in case we have folks with the same names like John Smith, um, for instance. That way we have a unique identifier uh, in addition to that. And then the last one, uh, we, identif we updated it so that uh, if uh, there's an internal um, inspection that will be done, we'll provide 72 hour notice this, uh, this is for standard issues. This is not for something that's uh, life-threatening or an immediate concern. The city reserves has the right to go in and address that similar as it would to an uh, owner-occupied house. But uh, for the purpose of a short-term <laughs> rental violation, um, it'd be 72-hour notice for an internal inspection prior to an internal inspection. And that is a list, general list of the uh, changes Let's see, um, before I conclude the staff presentation, I wonder if there are things 
Sharon, I'm going to check with you and see if there's anything that I missed. I think you have covered everything. Okay. Thank you. I'll also check with JR and Jeff. Anything additional? No, I think not. Okay. Uh, I will add uh, that there's a 12-month period for folks to come into compliance with this. Uh, we have talked about that being a grace period for ones that are currently in operation. And, oh, the other thing, too, is that is the clarification. On this packet, on page 27, there is a typo. And that is a carryover from a, a prior version. On page 27, it says that they would have six months to come into uh, compliance. That should be 12 months to come into compliance for the licensing. Scott, did yes, you sir. mention that the party house ordinance is really separate from the STRs? It is. Yes, good clarification. It's a separate ordinance. So, um, and it applies to any residential property. So with that, I'll stand for any questions. Questions? Do we need, do we just? Need we need to approve? vote if we want to recommend that these things are. I make, yeah. the, I make the motion we move to accept. Per, per staff comments on these changes. We have a motion and a second. We call. F Did you have a comment, JR? I see the eyes. Yeah, it's just a question. Who was yes. the second? Uh, Commissioner Duell, sorry. Uh, all in favor of approving or recommending that the MAPC recommend to the City Council approval of the municipal code changes, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Recommendation to the City Council moves forward 12 0. 12. We still have 12. Thank you for your participation in this long meeting. That's, yeah, I'm concerned about it too. But if we're watching it very closely and we can change it quickly. Oh, the meeting is now adjourned. Thank you for your participation.